Chad Robichaud. Yeah. Dude, I I know you from my research, from reading your book, uh, former Recon Marine. Am I saying that right? Recon Marine, that's the phrase? You are, yep. Okay, Recon yeah. Marine, uh, best, best-selling author, a lot of books, including like this one's like literally one of the best books I've read in a long, long time. Loved it. Um, founder of Mighty Oaks Foundation, uh, helped almost half a million uh, half a million veterans with PTSD. So like that's who you're known for, huge Instagram following. Uh, but take me back before that, who was... Chad Robichaux. Yeah, well, I'm from uh, Southern Louisiana, so I'm kind of a Cajun okay. uh, boy at heart, like very Southern Louisiana, mud between my toes. <laughs> like, I grew up in the swamps and and uh, a, a long history of military in my family. So me being in the military is not like something new. Uh, 80, 84 years or so, uh, wow. my, World War II, Korea. My father was the first Marine in our family who served in Vietnam. You know, I, I was a Marine, Force Recon Marine, served at JSOC, did eight deployments to Afghanistan. Both my sons are Marines. One of them went to Afghanistan as well. So... Uh, going in the military was, you know, something that was something I wanted to do from a very young age as a kid, probably more so because I, I grew up in a very dysfunctional home because of my father's experience in Vietnam. He came home, didn't get well. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was very, this again, dysfunctional home, a lot of physical violence in my home, uh, physical abuse. And I don't mean spankings with belts, like, sure. I mean, like fist to face physical abuse. And, and so I think there was also, there was a one sense of me wanting to, get away from that and knowing that the military would be a way that I could leave home when I got old enough. Also, uh, uh, just something about my dad, like being a Marine, that was the only thing that I'd ever seen him make, make him happy or make him proud. There's something about him being a United States Marine that made him like, he was just a miserable man. So it made him happy. And I'm like, man, whatever, if I can make that guy happy, I kind of want a piece of that. Mm. And so my brother and I, he was a year older than me. Um, we were probably, we were probably like 13 and 14 years old and, and we saw this picture of this. I mean, we were always out playing in the swamps and bayous and woods and, uh, that's kind of how I grew up. I've, I've been hunt, like, I would go off on my own hunting when I was like in a P-Rog and when I was probably like seven years old, be my first memory of going out by myself with a, you know, crack barrel, four ten shotgun <laughs> and go hunting. And so I kind of grew up that kind of lifestyle, but we'd always be playing military and stuff and. And we saw this this picture, and I remember this video. Uh, I can't remember the name of the video, but it was these Navy SEALs. And I remember this picture of this Navy SEAL, like, coming out of the water, and he had, like, his face was painted green, and a boonie hat on, seaweed hanging off of him as M16 rifle and twin 80 scuba tanks on his back. And I remember seeing that and thinking, I want to do that, but I don't want to be in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there's something about my dad being in Marines, and I want to be a Marine. And, and so I learned about recon Marines, particularly uh, the Force Recon Marines at 3rd Force Recon Company, which ultimately ended up serving in that unit in Vietnam. And I became, as a teenager, like fascinated with these these recon and force recon marines in Vietnam, and and so that that sparked my interest as a kid to do that. And what is the, what is the difference between a marine and a force marine, force recon marine? Oh, yeah. Like, what does that mean? Well, I mean, you know, the Marine Corps, all different types of jobs in the Marine Corps, and then you know, the kind of core function, a core like like a job in the combat arms would be infantry, and then uh and then recon would be the sp- small special operations component of the Marine Corps. Uh, so in in special operations, you have two kind of commands that manage special operations. One special operation command, SOCOM, and the other is joint special operations command, which brings all those special operations units together. The Marine Corps never had a, uh, until uh, the early 2000s, never participated in that because the Marine Corps was like, we are self-sustained uh, fighting force. We don't want to participate. And so that was the Marine Corps' internal special operations was recon. The top 25% of recon or force recon. So guys that have been around a little longer, they're a little more specialized missions, that's force recon. So if you have a recon battalion which has, you know, Alpha Company, Bravo Company, Charlie Company, then there'll be a force recon company, which are guys that have been around a little longer, handpicked, a little more uh, experience, and maybe have proven themselves and become force recon marines, and they get more specialized missions. Uh, in 2000, and, and I think it was in 2001, SOCOM came down and said, you have to participate. And so they started a unit called Det One, which is Detachment One, kind of handpicked all the top four Shrikan guys, went to SOCOM, overperformed as expected. And, uh, and then the Marine Corps was tasked with giving us a SOCOM asset to the, uh, you know, to participate like every other branch had to. Mm-hmm. And so they pulled the fast one and said, okay, we're instead of, we want to keep recon. And so they decided to keep recon and start something new and just start MARSOC Marine special operations command, two totally different jobs. Uh, and, uh, and so Marine Corps still has exclusively recon and force recon. That's a direct asset to the Marine Corps to battalion commanders, regimental commanders and division commanders. And so, uh, it, to me, it's super special. It's one of the smallest special operations units in the military, about 750 people, uh, in it, 
just like the rest of the other you know special operations pipelines has about 80 percent attrition rate so very challenging not only physically but academically mentally to make it in and it's about a year-long pipeline so they go through this pipeline of going through recon school becoming recon marines uh, they go, it's called, they do four weeks of infantry school. Then they go to what's called BRPC, which is just crushing them. Then they go to basic recon course. Once they graduate that pre scuba combat diver, where they do an open closed circuit diving, jump school, military free fall school, Sierra school. And then when they get to the unit, they, they're, some of them are like 18, 19 years old, have all these skills already. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a really great route. Any young men, you know, men listening that want to do that, uh, go that route. It's of all the special operations jobs out there, to me, it's one of the most appealing ones. Uh, you know, they all they all do something a little bit different, so it depends what you want to do. But for me, that's like, you know, where I, where I want it to be and, uh, you know, got to do it. Uh, like I said, when I was 13 years old, I decided to do this. And me and my brother started running and swimming. We we're already kind of lifelong athletes. And we started running and swimming at the young age. About a year into that, tragedy hit my family and my brother was shot and killed. No. And yeah. So it was like extremely devastating to me. And Wow. And was that an accident or somebody went we, after we him? We don't really know. Uh, he was, we, we were broken families, Southern Louisiana, lots of divorce. And like yeah. I said, dysfunctional families. So he had a stepbrother on the other side of his family. We were together. Uh, and about an hour later, we went to our separate parents' homes and he had a stepbrother on that side. He was 11 years old. He was fit at the time I was 14. He was 15. The other brother was 11 and, and they were arguing. He had a phone. So people heard the argument yeah. and he had a, he had a fire poker in his hand. My brother did. And the, the 11 year old had a shotgun, a 20 gauge shotgun in his hand. Jeez. So don't know if it was in purpose or, or what happened, but uh, it was point blank rage. He died instantly. And uh, I, I was that my brother was the closest person to me at a time in my life. Cause you know, when you're in a dysfunctional environment like that, the siblings get real close. So, I went in a deep isolation. My mother couldn't handle the loss of her a son, so she went and lived back with her parents. My father didn't want to handle with a grieving wife. He took a job overseas, so I left me living with my 18-year-old sister, and and I was like trying to go to high school. Uh, luckily, thankful martial arts had kept me, gave me a place to have some grounding. But when I was about 17 years old, I realized I was working on a roofing company put shingles on houses in Louisiana in the summer, like, and trying, trying to go to school. I wasn't going to graduate high school. So I went to a Marine Corps recruiter and told them my situation and said, this is my dream. This is what I want to do. And, uh, but this is the situation I was in. And they, they helped me get in the Marine Corps in 1993. I was 17 years old without even a high school diploma. And, wow. uh, and so that was my entry into the Marine Corps and give me a fresh, really a fresh slate, a clean slate and fresh chance at, li at life. And, and I took advantage of it. You know, I signed the infantry contract and, Made a promise that I get my GED, and I did. And all these years later, I got an MBA. I was <laughs> I was joking. I'm speaking. I can't spell MBA, but I got one. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's because the Marine Corps. This guy, recruiter. I remember most people rec remember their recruiters' names because they hate them. I remember mine. You know, Staff Sergeant Ronald Brown. Like all these years later, because uh, he gave me a second chance at life, mm -hmm. and uh, and I took it. And and uh, right that first year, I tried out to be a recon marine, and very uh, luckily, I uh, uh, worked hard and I made it. And uh, and like I said, there's so many great jobs in the military, but none that fit my personality. Mm. better and I, I love that job it gave me a lot of opportunity to do everything i wanted to want to do in the military that's amazing yeah. man do you have any idea what happened to the 11 year old like where did he end up he ended up uh pretty he ended up going into uh some mental health uh yeah, so, that would mess you up yeah and then and then uh his father his ended up in jail uh he ended up in drugs and in jail and so i you know i think the father probably lost two sons that day and uh you know, I grew up like thinking this guy murdered my brother and stuff yeah. like that. But now that I'm older, I'm, I'm like, he's 11 years old. I, I don't yeah. really even know what happened. But, you know, unfortunately, I think two people you know, yeah. lost their lives that day. Yeah. And uh, crazy. Yeah, man. it was a ter 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 terrible situation. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm a big Second Amendment gun advocate. And, yeah. But uh, but I'm also, you know, big on teaching kids gun safety and at home. I've, I've had guns in my house my whole life. And, and, uh, yeah. and, believe on having you know every american having guns in their home but also yeah. big on teaching kids about guns like i said i've been carrying guns since i was a kid and and my, my boys have too and they always understood safety and you know i never allowed toy my my kid my boys still make fun of me i never ever allowed them to have toy guns mm. uh that that shot something you know I, I, when kids like stick the toy gun in somebody's yep. face like bang 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 like always just got to me yeah and so my i always wanted something with a projectile so my kids knew like there's consequences to pulling the trigger, and I, I taught them that way. And they, and they would, they'd be at their birthday and get somebody buy them a 
a gun and I'd be like, <laughs> they look at me and they're like, yep, we know where that's going. <laughs> well, and so, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's get a little controversial here. Maybe make some people angry. Uh, in the world where, you know, back in when the second amendment was written, right. you know, hundreds of years ago, we didn't have automatic rifles. We didn't, you know, like assault mm -hmm. rifles. We didn't have anything that we have today hardly at all. They didn't sure. have tanks. They didn't have any of that stuff. Right. We had little guns. Mm -hmm. Uh, does the second amendment still apply today? Uh, and I mean, I'm assuming yes. Yeah. How, how do we justify increasing technology with weapons with the second amendment? How do we reconcile those two things? Yeah. You know, and I, th I think it, I think it's a very good question that, that on both sides to consider those, those factors. The second amendment wasn't written for, first of all, for hunting uh, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, providing food that was, which is was, often people think, people think, yeah. yeah, it was, it was written to protect ourselves. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it should escalate with the threat, right? Yeah. So if I, you know, if I, I'm not going to be able to defend my home with a musket loader, right? <laughs> like if somebody's going to come to my home with a, with a Mac 10, yep. you know, they're going to be faced with my, you know, Smith and Wesson FPC, uh, and, and my, in in a, you know, my optic on it and they're going to be, you know, yeah. dealt with. Uh, so I, I believe that the threat has increased and, uh, and so does our ability to be able to defend ourselves, which isn't a, a healthy thing for any culture, but that's just, it is what, that's what it is. And so I think the, uh, you know, where, where America misses it and, you know, especially this, this administration, this white house, who's just stood up this, uh, pretty much what I believe anti-second amendment, yeah. uh, division of the white house called, I think it's called the gun, uh, like yeah protection yes. agency or I don't yeah, know yeah instead of but and they're not targeting an actual problem they're targeting weapons and they're talking targeting uh law-abiding citizens who are gun owners they're not targeting the crimes the criminals mm -hmm. and uh and so that's where the, the problem really lies and 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 i think what the the backlash of that is more americans feel the need more so to protect themselves because of that so you see this uh what they're trying to prevent creates a demand i mean every time uh, President Obama or President Biden has had this knee-jerk reaction to a mass shooting, and and, and express, you see gun sales spike and yeah. ammo spike sales spike, and so they're actually doing the opposite of what they think they're trying to accomplish. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but uh, you know, so I believe you know when this when the founders when the founders wrote this, I don't think they imagined you know the technology we would have today and the the weapon systems we would have today, but they certainly knew that you know, they would increase, you know, technically yeah. these are brilliant people who thought, I mean, they thought ahead of their time. That's so why I believe you know, some of the decisions they made were divine and, and God inspired because they thought way ahead of their yeah. time. And, uh, but I don't think it was written just for that time. I think it was written for a time like, like today. And, and, and the reason we're able to defend our homes and the reason that we remain a free country, uh, isn't just because our military It's because we have 340 million Americans, most of which, uh, out ratio by, by the way, I, I think maybe probably estimated by 500 million guns in the homes wow. of, of America's and and that that's one of the things that keeps America free people wonder you know how why we why do I think that we're not gonna see what would happen in Venezuela happen in Venezuela because you know the state may come and take it like people really mean that here and, yeah. uh, and people aren't gonna the government's not gonna be able to come and just grab weapons away from people like in some of these other countries I don't think that's ever gonna happen in America and we have yeah. far too many guns. Now, I'm an I'm an ambassador. For, um, I'm one of two brand ambassadors for uh, actually there's four two shooters and then myself and Travis Kennedy are brand ambassadors for Smith and Wesson Firearm. Mm. And uh, and honestly, the reason why I chose I said yes to Smith and Wesson's Firearms when they came up to me is because they're they're a self defense company. Uh, they they believe in Ameri traditional American values and they really stand up for the Second Amendment. And so that was one of the reasons I partnered with them. And uh, and uh, and I I really get out there and try to advocate for people not only being able to defend themselves safely handle a firearm be able to protect themselves and their family not just by buying a purchasing a firearm because we can but as right as our rights as Americans but training themselves in the belt to safely because uh, of what happened to my brother right be able to safely have that firearm in their home and and when the situation arises know how to defend themselves and and be able to use that firearm so whatever firearm they you purchase you should be able to be very proficient with that firearm. So how, how do we deal with the school shootings? Like, I mean, how do you, in a world where, yeah, the guns are not going away. It's a, it's a sure. you can argue that all day long, but you can't take away 500 million guns from mm -hmm. Americans. It's not going to happen. So knowing that, how do we deal with the school shootings? Well, I think how many, uh, you know, how many mass shootings do we see in the halls of Congress? Uh, we haven't seen any, right? Yeah. Not, not, uh, and the reason why is because the type of security they have in the, in the Congress, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to have a mass shooter walk into Congress and go shoot up. So why, why are we, why do we have all the security for, you know, people who are 
of elected public officials, but have like no security, the softest. As a military guy, if I'm looking, if I'm putting my, the, my terrorist hat on, which I've never been a terrorist in America, but I have been in other countries, uh, I'm looking for the softest target. Yeah. And, and the softest target in America is unfortunately, and it's the truth that everybody needs to hear, is our schools. If, I, if I'm a terrorist and I want to terrorize a, a community, terrorize a nation and make people feel vulnerable, I'm going to look for the softest target that's going to sting the most in the hearts of the And it's going to be your schools. And I mean, you, if you can't feel safe sending your kids to school, you don't feel safe at all, right? You, and, uh, and, and so we had this softest target that, or gun-free zones, uh, the teachers aren't allowed to carry and protect themselves. Uh, they're not hardened facilities. Uh, you have private companies trying to come up with every way to make door stops and, and all this stuff where why isn't the, why isn't our government doing this? Why isn't the school board yeah. having, having a, have it, have a office for school security? Why is, why is, uh, you have one dare officer that's like 400 pounds overweight and can't, you know, his guns probably melting in his holster cause he never even <laughs> shot it. And they you know, why, why is, why is that the, uh, not the priority to protect these kids. And so when somebody is mentally ill uh, or mentally deranged or just straight evil, whatever, the, it doesn't matter, walks into school and kills you know, a bunch of children, um, why are we looking at, at guns as the issue? Yeah. Man, you, you, it's, it goes 20 steps back. Like, first of all, we should be dealing with the mental health. I and mean, every time one of these things happen, you look at, you, you're able to identify, like this person had a pattern of mental health. People knew it. Uh, and, and nobody did anything about it. Um, sometimes they, you know, a lot of times the district attorneys, you know, have dealt with this and didn't get the person to help they need it. But oftentimes if they would have had just a few security protocols in place, the thing would have never happened. They would have been stopped at the door or, you know, and, uh, or maybe they would have killed someone, but they wouldn't have killed 20 people. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, and the thing is also that I think is to be considered is that evil people are going to do evil things yeah. and uh, whether they have guns or not. Right. They, I mean, if I, if, if I couldn't get a gun in a school, well, I could get a vehicle to drive through a, a, a school bus stop and, and take out people. And so sometimes, you know, evil things are going to happen and it doesn't mean we're going to be able to solve all of them. And that's a harsh thing to say, but it's just true. I mean, we're in an evil world and, uh, and yeah. in a broken world and, and, um, you know, there's not always a solution to everything, but, uh, certainly disarming good citizens, uh, is not the solution. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a great answer, that's, man. yeah, that's my, my, it's good, man. <laughs> I uh, don't disagree with you on that one. Uh, all right. I want to get into another, uh, slightly controversial talk. Uh, and that is involving just America's role as kind of a police in the world. And there's been a lot of negativity around that. But before we get into that question, I do want to hit the, this week's uh, first you know, show uh, sponsor. Now, as we do with every show, all the ad revenue from the show goes directly to a charity of your choosing. So the question is, what breaks your heart and why? And where should we give all the money from the show toward? Yeah, well, uh, if those listeners don't know, uh, we have over 20-something veterans of our, uh, uh, in our country that take their life every day. Uh, so Jeez. veteran suicide is, a, all, yeah. is an epidemic in our country. Uh, many people might think it's a thing of the past. I was just speaking at First Marine Division, and uh, and I was reported, they reported, reported there that currently in the Marine Corps is the highest on record suicide rate ever. Wow. And that's just that's in September of this year. It's already broke the record of ever, the highest suicide rate. So right now, this is a major problem. Uh, Mighty Oaks Foundation is the foundation that I found, found it 12 years ago. Uh, on our resiliency events, I've spoken over half a million active duty troops on suicide prevention and resiliency. Uh, we have recovery programs. We do about $8 million a year in programs for free. We, we bring active duty service members, veterans, first responders, spouses to these programs. Uh, we have five ranches around the country, and we, we help. We love on them. Well, we do uh, faith-based peer-to-peer mentoring plug them in the aftercare system and it's just an incredible program that we've successfully helped you know thousands of uh, people through and, and they equip them to go back and help others that's pay it forward type program and so uh, that's what i my full-time job is and the ceo and founder of this organization and it's just a privilege probably one of the most humbling things I've ever been part of to be able to work there and, and and help pay forward to others what people did for me when i came home wow so. man. all right i want to dig into that later in the conversation for sure and kind of what led you to do that but before we get to all that Let's roll this week's ad. Hey, sorry for the interruption, but this is super actually important. I think you're going to love this. Here's how you become wildly wealthy and ridiculously good looking. How's that for an intro? Look, I know it's an ad, but take some notes. I think it's going to help. First, you set a vision for what you want your future to look like. Then you turn that vision into annual and then quarterly goals. And then you identify the actions that you need to take regularly that are going to get you there. 
Then you track those actions. And then you add on accountability with other high achievers who are tracking theirs to ensure you're actually doing the stuff you know you need to do. And then finally, you improve relentlessly with education and networking. And that's it. You can literally accomplish like anything through that framework. And that is exactly what the Better Life Tribe is. So whether you want to retire young with a multi-million dollar portfolio, uh, real estate deals, or maybe you want to impress your spouse with your amazing six pack or, you know, whatever, something else. The Better Life Tribe is going to get you there. And while the tribe only opens a few days every year, you can be the first to hear about our next opening by joining the wait list at abetterlife.com slash wait. That is abetterlife.com forward slash wait. All right, man. Well, yeah, like I said, I want to get more into a little bit later the PTSD and, and what you're doing there to help. Uh, but first, you know, as an American, sometimes I tend to feel guilty uh, mm. in terms of why should we be the police of the mm. world? And especially the media today and over the last 20 years has more increasingly made Americans feel guilty for being involved anywhere else. Like we, yeah. we shouldn't have a say in that. Like why are we involved in Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, Syria, anywhere? Mm -hmm. uh, we should just stay out of everyone else's business. Yeah. Uh, are we the police of the world? Uh, and mm. why, like how are we able to do that? Why is that okay? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean... I think the strongest kid in the playground has a responsibility to to place the play place the playground <laughs> sometimes, right? If there's a bully if there's a bully taking kids' lunch money, somebody needs to walk over and punch him in the nose mm. and make sure he stops taking other kids' money. So I mean, America is the strongest and greatest nation in the world. Period. Uh, I mean, um, we're not where we were, and we're not where we should be, and uh, and uh, and we're losing more and more freedoms every day. And uh, you know, I'm not content where Mer where America is, but I'll tell you from someone that's been to over 60 countries around the world. This is still the greatest place to live in the planet, mm. uh, despite all of our junk going on. And uh, and we still have the greatest military force in the history of the world. And there, a certain responsibility comes with that. And so when you see injustices around the world, uh, genocides and tyranny around the world, and uh, peop you have people around the world who can't defend themselves, legitimately can't defend themselves, but want to, and they're being victimized, there is a responsibility that comes with, with that. And I think sometimes that responsibility means going in and help people. Now, with that, I think a lot of, People, particularly the media, who tries to villainize this country for whatever reason they've chosen to do that, they uh, they group all of those things in one basket. Iraq was very different than Afghanistan. Most mm. Americans think that the global war on terrorism, Iraq and Afghanistan, are the same thing. And, Until and it, I read your book, <laughs> I never thought of them as separate. That sounds yeah. so silly now to no, say that. Most Americans do. Yeah, yeah, I just assumed Iraq, Afghanistan, same thing, same yep. problem, same people, same issue. So, so yeah. such two totally different scenarios. Uh, and then, so sometimes we're placing the world and sometimes we shouldn't be to be honest with you i'm a, I'm yeah. a nationalist i believe that you know a, a strong america has the ability to defend people around the world but we have to be a strong america first so i, I as a nationalist i believe that we should come first mm -hmm. uh but so sometimes we have police around the world but there's but then uh places like afghanistan we weren't going there for the afghanistan's interest we went there to retaliate for 9-11 uh to eradicate the taliban to defend our national interests and national security and the global security of terrorism. That's why we went there. Now, politicians chose to stay there and do nation building, which in some, in some it depends on the day. Like sometimes I might agree with that because uh, there's some good things, but other times I think, you know, maybe we, we overstretch and try to put democracy in a place that doesn't want democracy. And, and America has a history of doing that. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, there's, you know, so there's some, some truth, to that but i think if you if you're gonna have that view you should look at each scenario and make the decision like you know what is america doing in this part of the world why we're there because this thought is what led to the what, what led to the i won't say it led to the surrender of afghanistan it led to the justification that the white house used for the surrender of afghanistan i'll say justification because they knew better president biden knew better than the withdrawal from afghanistan but he did it anyway, and he used that as a justification. He's lied to the American people, and every news media outlet lied to the American people so much that I think most Americans believed it. We're in a 20-year war. It's an endless war. We can't continue to kill America's sons and daughters. Why are we fighting this war? The Afghan people won't fight for themselves. Why should we defend them? We're spending billions of dollars. So all these things we're told over and over. We're like, oh, that's right, right. And then after it's over, we're like, okay, the withdrawal was messed up, but we had to leave anyway. We could have just did it better. No. Like, I, we had 2,500 troops there. Uh, President Trump should have declared a victory of the Afghan war on terror in, tw in 2018. He didn't. I don't know why he didn't. He was planning on doing it after the election, and, and, he, and he, I think he screwed himself on it because he should have declared it. The truth is, 
what we were actually doing since 2018 was supporting and advising the Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police. And this is what America does really well and creates global st- global security and security for the best interests of the United States. This wasn't policing Afghanistan and building democracy in Afghanistan. It was putting the Afghans in a position for them to fight the Taliban in the mountains of Afghanistan. And what we did over 20 years is we built this uh, base, Bakken Air Force Base, that's, by the way, the most strategic place in the globe between Iraq, Iran, Russia, and China. The entire international community was participating in this strategic location, and it was working to keep the Taliban at bay in the mountains of Afghanistan. Our troops weren't fighting. Our troops were supporting and advising the Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police. Now, special operations are fighting, but we do that all over the world anyway. So that's not, I mean, conventionally, we were not fighting. And so this system was working really well. And at one point, we had 2,500 troops there. During a time of the draw, I think the number was like 3,800 troops. And, and this is, and you got the president of the United States saying, we have to get out. We in this, I can name 12 places right now if you quiz me, uh, places we have 2,500 <laughs> troops around the world. They just not talked about because it it's not super sure. popular. Uh, and it's not politically, there's no political incentive for saying it. Like places like Djibouti, Africa, we have like, we have like 3,700 troops there right now. So to say that Afghanistan was different, it wasn't any different. And if you really want to contrast that, since World War II, we still have 80,000 troops in Japan. Since World War wow. II, we still have 40,000 troops in Germany. Since the Korean War, we still have 35,000 uh, 35, troops in South Korea wow. protecting that 30th parallel from keeping the North Koreans coming over. That's not because we're storing wars and staying prolonged wars or, or <coughs> policing the world. That's so we keep global stability because if the U.S. didn't maintain those places like we did after World War II in Korea, it would create a collapse and instability would happen. And that's what's happening in Southeast Asia right now by leaving Afghanistan. And that's why you see guys like al-Zahari, who's ISIS, walking around Kabul and, and the White House is high-fiving because they killed him. And I'm like, I'm glad he's dead, but why was he there? The Doha agreement that you guys signed with the Taliban said he shouldn't have been there. You gave a terrorist a regime, the most evil one in the world, a country in a hotbed of terrorism in the most strategic place on the globe that our enemies, China, Iran, North Korea, they all wanted that place and we gave it to them. And by the way, we didn't even talk to our international partners. We didn't advise them through doing this. We didn't talk to the Afghan government. We spent 20 years putting in place. The only people we talked to behind closed doors was the Taliban or any 20 years and, and through this Doha agreement, which was an agreement to say, we'll let you have this country, but you can't have any terrorists come there or you can't conduct terrorism, which is null and void from the sign of the contract because the Taliban are terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> and I can tell you that the government still sees them as terrorists because as we did the evacuations, if I paid them any money, I would be in jail because I'm, I'm, I'm paying money to a terrorist organization. Yeah. So you still see them that way, yet the U.S. government negotiated this contract with them. But we don't negotiate so, with terrorists. But we don't. Yeah, we don't negotiate yeah. terrorists. <laughs> but, but, they, but they could sign a, this Doha agreement with them saying they won't allow terrorism, which, like, again, they're, they're terrorists. So why, so why do we pull... I mean, you know, we can get into the, the, the mess of get, getting in there and getting out and all mm-hmm. that, but why, the, why did Biden pull us out? And, you know, like, Trump said it first, we're pulling out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Biden then pulled us out. Why? Mm-hmm. Like, what was it political? Like, the election yep. season coming up? What was that? Well, I'll say this. First of all, Trump Trump did initiate this, and I don't agree with that. Uh, I, I was just, I was the veterans policy surrogate on the Trump campaign, and I will say, and I would say it if you know President Trump was in here, I did not agree with him initiating that conversation. However, there was a difference in the strategy, and, and Mike Pompeo, Secretary Pompeo, say this: um, what President Trump intended to do was declare the victory, hand Bagram Air Force Base over to the international community. And then the U.S. so this base went went to the Taliban, and the in the it would have equipped the Afghan National Army and would have kept the contingency there, so it would have been a coordinated thing. It would have maintained Bagram Air Force Base, and the deal with the Taliban. Again, I don't agree with him having a deal with the Taliban, but what his deal with the Taliban was, it was, it was, uh, it was terms. There was terms for it. They had to agree to these certain terms and not a timeline. So Biden came in and said, uh, "We're gonna we're gonna leave by a certain timeline." And there was no terms attached to it. There was no consequences attached mm-hmm. to it. So there's a big difference in those two strategies. Uh, when Biden said he was going to do this, uh, and I don't even want to call it a draw. It was a surrender to the Taliban. Uh, it wasn't a botch withdrawal. Anything. It was a full surrender to the Taliban. First of all, you have to know his joint chiefs, General Malay's office, and all the generals advised against it. Um, they were on record advising against it. All the intelligence leader, uh, community leaders advised against His own Appointed cabinet members advised against it. They were, we have what's called 12 diplomats on the ground. Any country we have around the world, there's the RSO, Regional Security Officer for the State Department. That's represents the State Department. You have an ambassador there. We have our uh, chief of station who represents the CIA there. And there's diplomats on the ground. And their responsibility is to be able to assess the, the climate of that area and be able to advise 
the Secretary Blinken of the State Department and President Biden in the White House. Those 12 diplomats sent a dis, what's called a dissent cable, a secure cable, to the White House and to Secretary Blinken, was sent Secretary Blinken's office to advise the president, do not withdraw, do not execute this withdrawal. Afghanistan will collapse. And uh, and that was hidden. It came out there in the Senate hearings and, to, and uh, Congress had to actually subpoena it. Secretary Blinken still didn't want to turn it over. He had to threaten to hold him in contempt. It would have been the first time in history. And when it came out, we've seen these 12 diplomats advise. So the, I'm saying all that to say President Biden had every 100% of his advisors told him not to, yet he alone chose to do it anyway. Even his Secretary of State, he alone chose to do it anyway. So I can't say his motivation. I can't speak to his motivation. I could speak to, to the only thing I could do is reverse engineer it and speak to who benefited. The only person that benefited from the withdrawal of Afghanistan or surrender of Afghanistan was not the American people, certainly. It wasn't our international partners who knew nothing about it, and now they're the world's more dangerous place because of it. It wasn't the Afghan people, the 40 million Afghan people, uh, 20 million women and little girls that are now sexually enslaved as you know, as nine years old, it, it was, and starving to death and freezing to death. It, it wasn't the uh, our SIVs, who the th- 100,000 SIVs we left behind, or our Americans we banned in there. The only people that benefited this was our enemies. China, Iran, uh, Pakistan, ISI. That's the main beneficiaries. Pakistan, ISI, because it's the most strategic intelligence uh, place in the planet. Uh, uh, Iran, because they, from a security standpoint, they wanted Afghanistan as well, and they want to be able to move sanctioned oil to to uh, China, who wants to buy it. Uh, so could, Afghanistan's in between China. It's and between, Iran, right? yeah. yeah. And the only way they can they can move it across that land or pipeline, which they're already building, they were already building infrastructure. They just couldn't do it, and so immediately they started moving sanctioned off that that uh trade that the, this five for five americans for iranians there was six billion dollars attached to it you remember that that we yeah, like why do we give them six billion dollars yeah. that that six billion dollars was from iran uh iran china uh sanctioned money that was seized hmm. and so they they immediately start moving money because that was over a ship now they're doing it across land so iran wanted us out for that china wanted access to it also china wanted it and china also wanted the mineral rights to the lithium mineral rights in the hindu kush mountains uh which is worth they say trillions of dollars but it's probably infinite amount of dollars uh, by the way you know um america's creating demand for that with yeah. the electric cars and everything like that so you're talking like infinite amount of money and i, I said this in a uh, in june of 2021 in July, that this was the motivation, and I got hammered saying it was conspiracy. Well, we left August thirty first, and September first, uh, the Taliban gave China those those mineral rights to those, those mineral rights. And so, I can't say why President Biden made the decision, but I can easily point to without conspiracy who benefited from it. And uh, and you know, again, Pakistan ISI pretty much runs uh, runs Afghanistan now. The Taliban is just a, a front, just a face. Um, but they don't run anything. They're a bunch of uh, degenerate cavemen yeah. with, with guns. So, <laughs> yeah. Wow. So who is Aziz? So um, after uh, 9-11, during 9-11, I was, I'd already been in almost 10 years. I was a sergeant at 3rd Force Recon Company. I was a, when I was a military free fall team leader. Um, and, uh, and so when 9-11 happened, uh, I knew, you know, we're gone. Uh, and uh, and I, I thought my unit would deploy right away, and we didn't. And so I had this opportunity to try out for a JSOC task force, Joint Special Operations Command Task Force. If you don't know what JSOC is, it's where all the premier, you know, SEAL Team 6, Delta Force, like all the premier units are there. Uh, they, they have a new name for it, I can't say, but he's formerly called TF Orange. All these uh, units, the, our, our best special operations unit, units are at, uh, at JSOC. So uh, I tried out, got accepted, and went to one of those units and, and, did, uh, and ultimately did eight deployments uh, there. Wow. So I got to represent the Marine Corps uh, at that unit and um, and my job there was AFO advanced force operator which not a lot of people know about it it's probably the closest thing to being undercover you work in a singleton capacity by yourself and you get teamed up usually with local nationals really you're by yourself you're not you're just out there yeah like I, I was say, saying earlier him like like I, I didn't uh, I, I eight deployments I probably spent two weeks on a base like wow. I I, uh, I would me and Aziz partnered up he started as my interpreter became my teammate highly trained uh, as my teammate and ultimately, you know, became a friend. And so we spent uh, probably over 100 operations where we go in non-permissive areas where conventional military is not allowed to go look for and orchestrate the operation to put our assaulters from our, our, our command on target to capture, kill bad guys. And my command was like, whoever was top 10 on the list, you know, Ben Laden being number one, you know, to number 10, whoever that's, that's who we're going after. So, so they, they identify a target and we need to get our assaulters on this target to capture, kill this guy. Aziz and I would go spend weeks, sometimes months 
in that area building all the clandestine infrastructure to have the ability to get safe, get the guy safely on a target, have all the logistical assets they need on the ground, and then safely get off with all the contingencies in place for anything that would have went wrong. And so that's was my job. You know, wow. I think a lot of people think, you know, as special operations, being you know, a JSOC task force, you know, kicking a door, shooting bad guys in the face, uh, you know, part of those teams, but mainly my job was, was the AFO. Did the, the did Afghans that. know that's what you were doing when you were, or were you, hey, I'm just a tourist hanging around? Like, what was your... No, that's part like, of being an AFL is, is building a really, not shallow, but legitimate cover. So, yeah. like, you know, building businesses and setting up things. And you, you, you try to get all the Afghans, local nationals, to do that for you. Yeah. And then you're just there kind of orchestrating it and doing your other job, you know. Yeah. Now, now you have some people that are witting, very few. Aziz would have been one of the witting people that knows what's going on. And then you have some people that are partially witting, all the way to people to most people that have no idea what they're involved in. And wow. uh, and so, you know, and it's not, like I said, it's not a very shallow thing because you're not, you know, you're not down in Washington, D.C. putting a hot dog stand up and taking pictures. You're yeah. you're in another country with foreign intelligence agencies, so you better have your stuff wired tight. And uh, a tremendous amount of training to do that that job. And, and uh, I didn't even know the job existed until I actually uh, went to do it. And uh, and I can tell you, like, I don't know if I would have been interested in it before, but once I did it, that was like, there's a lot of great jobs in special operations, kind of niche, little unknown jobs. But for me, there's probably nothing that fit my personality more. Like, I love doing that job. And uh, and, and I, I couldn't imagine doing it with anybody else besides Aziz. As, you know, as we, like I said, we spent weeks, months out in those mountains, and he saved my life. I, I'd say specifically, like, saved my life on three occasions specifically. But probably... Uh, save my life every day. Like don't walk there. Don't eat that. Don't talk to that person. If you talk right now, they're going to kill us. Like he just, uh, he was just there for me, always looking out for me. And, uh, you know, I give some examples of, uh, if you want to like some, sure, man. some of the kinetic times he saved my life, but, Dude, uh, let's hear it. but it, yeah. So one, uh, I hadn't shared until recently. I don't, I, I didn't even write it in the book. Um, and, uh, and uh, so I know the Pentagon didn't redact this. And by the way, if you read the book, that's a lot of, yeah, redactions as redactions yeah. because they had to go through a Pentagon review because uh, of my time at JSOC and Pentagon had it they had it for like I think six or seven months and it came back with a and, and I, I left all the black lines in it uh, and by the yeah. way you can't hold the candle up and see the words underneath yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> some people ask me that if you, but uh, yeah so uh, we were in a place called Batakut Afghanistan uh, which is uh, you know kind of towards out towards Jalalabad which people some people more heard more about Jalalabad Batakut's latest forming village it's really beautiful, by the way. Like, I think everybody thinks of Afghanistan as, like, desert and rocky mountains. It's, I mean, lush green, like, pine forest and, really? and, and gray granite rocks. It's just beautiful. And, uh, and Batakut's, like, this high altitude, like, farming village. It's, uh, I mean, the, the agriculture's great there. The soil is great. And, and uh, so we were, it was the middle of winter. I remember, I, like, tundra, like, cold. And, uh, and, we, and we parked in the woods in these pine trees, and we walked across this field that nothing was growing at the time it was winter but i remember being like like just so irritated with disease because walking through this like like ankle like ankle deep sloshy snow mud and i'm like freezing cold and i'm like man disease you're dragging us through this mud that, that mud ended up saving our life later so we walk through this mud and we get to the other in this field and um and we get to the field there's old farmers there and he came over and told us and he's talking to disease and i couldn't understand what they were saying and basically what he said was the taliban's here and they're looking for a foreigner that he knows here, which was me. And so we're like, hey, Aziz's like, hey, brother, we have to get out of here. And so we start walking back across that field. Now this field's a large open danger area. And the road's about 100 yards behind us. We both had, we had AKS and AK-47. And, uh, and you know, just regular plain clothes on. And uh, and I remember hearing those three trucks, like, drive behind us. I caught them perif out of my peripheral because they actually were bold enough to have Taliban flags, the black flags flying, mm, yeah. which meant they were pretty, his U.S. military conventionally was not there at the time. And uh, as I drove by, I remember them hitting the brakes and backing up. And uh, I'm like, man, we're you know these guys are gonna you know, try to try to stop us. But I'm thinking like, one, they're not gonna they can't drive their trucks in that mud, which I said that mud ended up being yeah. a good thing because they would have got stuck. And and two, you know, Taliban. There's not a lot of like people think of like random crime. Like if you're in the streets of Chicago and you go in the wrong area, you're probably just gonna get killed. The Taliban usually like they want permission. They don't want to do anything without permission. So they don't know who we are. They're not just random. I'm thinking they're not gonna randomly just shoot us. They, and we're not going to certainly walk to them, so we're just going to keep walking and ignore them. 20 or 30 of them get out of the trucks, and they start yelling at us. And uh, just so we just ignore them. I couldn't understand what they were saying because they were speaking Pashtun. I, I spoke a pretty good Dari around that time. But I heard the word Bosh, which in both languages means stop. And probably the only thing I stopped <laughs> was my heart. And, uh, and uh, again, kept ignoring them. And we had talked about what we would do as far as immediate action drills. 
if anything happened. And we talked about doing it bounding like an Australian peel out of that field. And uh, I'm never thinking that we would have to do it. And uh, I, I remember hearing like a, I don't know if I heard first. I've been talking about this a lot lately. I don't know what I heard first. I either heard the gunfire or, or the pop. If you ever, Hopefully you never had a round crack over your head. But if you did, it's like you just hear like the air like kind of like break over your head. Uh, and anybody's been a rifle range and oh, in the butts of a rifle range, you hear that. But I heard that round break over my head. And, and, uh, and I remember thinking like, if we run, they're going to kill us. We try to run through sloshy mud in the middle of the open field. If we just throw our hands up and turn ourselves in, they're going to capture us or kill us. Uh, the only option in that moment is like, you know, we're outnumbered two to, in the middle of open field, 100 yards away, two to two to 30. Like, we, the only option still is to fight. And so I, I turned around. I, I just stayed in the standing, like standing. I turned around, and the first person I saw was, you know, there was 30 guys there, but the first person I saw was, was a guy standing against the passenger door of his red pickup truck, and he had his AK-47. And I just fired two rounds right center mass. And I thought I missed him because the window behind him busted out. And uh, so I actually thought I missed him. I remember thinking, like, I can't believe I missed this guy. Uh, and uh, and But I think he went back, and his head probably hit the window. Mm. And he fell, and it was like I was expecting, like, a hail of gunfire to come yeah, back yeah. at us. But I think we shocked them. I don't think they thought we were going to fight. So they actually ran behind their the trucks, and, and I just yelled the disease, move. And so – we initiated this uh, bounding, which is I continue shooting, so emptying my magazine while Aziz is moving. He sets in place. He starts shooting. Now I move past him while I reload, get you know past him and, and set. And it's just, you continue to do that bounding off of a, a, don't, a open danger area. So lateral Australian peel is, is, is what you know you also call it. And while we we're doing that, we probably got three iterations in. And one of the reasons one of the reasons this works is is not only you're covering your guy, but you draw in the gunfire to you because people aren't worried about the guy running. They're worried about the guy shooting. Yeah. So, you know, as I'm shooting, they're focused on me. And so he, he needs to move as far as he can and get reset while he's reloading. So if he stops and shoots, he's going to draw the fire to him, put himself in danger. And so when I seen him stop in my peripheral, I'm like, what's he doing? And then he shoots. Well, I didn't, I didn't know what it, he put himself in danger. I didn't know what he had saw, but, uh, I didn't see this guy pop up with an RPG, a rocket propelled grenade launcher, and he did. And and that fire would have came to me. So that guy would have launched that rocket at me and, and took me out. Maybe took him out too. But uh, but I never saw it. He stopped in the middle of being covered, exposed himself, and shot that guy and dropped him before the rocket went off. And when that happened, we were just both like, I was just like, run. And we, we just ran in a tree line and, and drove off. We got back, we went back to our safe house. They couldn't drive across that field. Reported it, and, uh, and the, our contact to command was like, a, we, we couldn't talk to the CEO or XO at the time. Um, and so we talked to the CI guy and he's like, oh, you guys, you think it's compromised? Because the operation was still like 10 days out. And we're like, I don't think so. Like we, they just like chance contact. Like uh, I think they thought a foreigner was there, but I don't think it's compromised. And so Aziz is like, no, man, we're, we're good. Let's stay. And we stayed there another 10 days and the command came in and the capture kill. They actually killed that guy. He was number six on the list. Really? And uh, yeah, so that was one of like several times Aziz saved my life. I mean, we went... Another time, I just he just got recognized before Congress. We went and did recovery of these four seals from Dev Group uh, that was trapped in this Taliban village. And you know, Dev Group certainly would have got him out. They'd have probably killed everybody in the village, though. And the mission would have been compromised. So they asked us to try to do a clandestine extraction first. And and I, they, I was me and Aziz and one other Afghan, and and I was like, kind of lost for how we we're gonna do it. And Aziz is like, just let's just drive in there and get them. And we drove through a night and we got those guys. And so he got recognized. I think he's the first Afghan ever to get recognized before Congress and something like that. Wow. And so he's just an amazing human being. And when we went and when Aziz and I wasn't operating, I didn't go back to base and, and he went home. I went to his house, like a, his wife, Hatra, like, you know, weeks in those cold mountains and your first warm meal, like he, she'd make our first warm meal as Palau with lamb. And, and then I held his, his son, Mashu, when he was born and his, and his baby girl, Mashu, when she was born, held them as babies. Like they're family wow. to me, man. Like, so, uh, you know, and, and, and in 2006, we had a compromise on operation. I wrote about in the book, this guy, Bashir, mm, he was from, yeah. he was, he was a double zero guy with the CIA. What's Came double up, zero? Uh, it's, a, it's a Afghan and SIV, uh, Afghan inter, like interpreters, or not really interpreters, Afghan soldiers that work with the CIA. Okay. And, uh, and, and then he's tried out for this special program, came over to us. We trained them to work with us and me and Aziz spent like, I like, I slept on the side of mountains with this guy, like just be him and Aziz before like, dude was like, he was solid. And, uh, and for some reason, I don't know why. Uh, maybe he got extorted or whatever, but he turned over to the Taliban. Jeez. And when he did, he uh, 12 of our teammates were captured. Two Americans and 10 Afghans were killed. And it may not sound like a big deal, but these Afghans were like, 
they were like family to me. Like I ate in their homes, play soccer with their kids. Like I love these guys and they love me. And they were, they were three years. I was in a you know close personal relationship with these guys. So, and they were, I was responsible for them. So it's devastating to me. In addition to that, Aziz was compromised now, uh, and has been since. So he had to operate in different capacities since then. Uh, they drove a vehicle bomb in our house, uh, my house in Kabul and none of us was there thankfully, but our guard we suspect was killed. And then, uh, and then I get into being abducted by a foreign intelligence agency. I can't say which one It's redacted in the book, but, uh, if you read the book, you probably, you probably could put the piece together, which foreign agency grabbed me heavily interrogated me. And then after that, we still kept operating and we caught it. We caught Bashir, our unit caught him, put him in, uh, Bagram jail. He had tons of like data on where we slept, who slept yeah. in which bed, where our safes were, our routes, our times, uh, vehicles. Like he was plotting on us and giving that to the Taliban. He went to Polycharki jail uh, from there. Went to Some guys went to Guantanamo Bay. Other guys went to Saudi. And in 2011, uh, President Obama did a mass release of Taliban prisoners and he was released. He went back mm -hmm. to the Taliban, became a leader. And so when President Biden makes that announcement for the withdrawal, Bashir contacts Aziz and says, I'm coming to get you, kills another guy that used to work with us and, and tells, uh, tells Aziz that now I'm in charge of Kabul now and I'm coming to get you and your, and your wife and kids. Jeez. So when, when, when this happened, it wasn't like, oh, Aziz, they're going to withdraw. Aziz is going to get, you know, he was a, he was a ter interpreter, so he's going to get killed. No, this is very like personal. And we had tried since 2016. Aziz did 15 years at JSOC. Since 2016, we had been putting in for his SIV visa process, which is only supposed to take nine months. Uh, but all these guys that worked in these classified programs, the paperwork was super complicated, and the State Department doesn't have any common sense. I mean, best way I could describe it is like, go to, you go to DMV, and they're like, no. they're like, I just moved here, and they're like, well, we need your, you know, we need your electric bill. I just moved here. You know, it's like <laughs> stupidity at the highest level. So Aziz, because of that, was stuck in Afghanistan for the last six years when he rightfully should have came here. And I know people in Congress and Senate, I have a lot of connections and still couldn't pull it off. And so I was like, we have to make, we have to get Aziz out. Like, he's my friend. We, we're going to get him. That's common, isn't it? There's a very lot of common. interpreters that can't they can't get out. Very very common. I mean, I was. Uh, I mean, not only before, like, like all these guys. First of all, like in 2009, uh, Congress and Senate made this agreement. Uh, I don't have the the bill number with me, but uh, but essentially was is if they contractually fulfilled their promise to the United States government, then they would have a nine month process initiated for the path to citizenship. All they needed was a contract number, a letter, a letter reference from their superior, background check. It's supposed to be a pretty streamlined process because of their contract, contractual uh, obligation. You know, so people could push back and say, hey, you know, they shouldn't come here, whatever, you know, just because they served with us, they shouldn't have that right. It doesn't matter our opinion. We, we made a contract with them, yeah. right? And our government made a contract with them and, and, they, and we should honor it. Uh, I mean, if, if we can't honor that, then how do, we, uh, how do we get local nationals to help us in future wars around the world? Like we... We're saying we, you know, we we're saying this when we need you, but we're gonna renege on our on our word, which is way more than I think civilians realize. Yeah, how yeah. much the locals help yeah. in war. Oh, it's it's impossible. I mean, look, we we were like I said, we were getting the top ten bad guys and, and hundreds. I, I was did over a hundred of those missions like I described, and I wouldn't have been successful in one of them if it wasn't for Aziz. Not one. Yeah. There's no way I could pull that off. Uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to, to go into, I mean, I'm going into like the FADA, the federal ministry tribal area. I'm going into mountains of Afghanistan, across the border in Pakistan. Like it's, it's impossible. You can't do those kind of missions and, and special operations missions all, all over the world uh, require us to be able to have these local nation, national relationships. So when we do something like this, it jeopardizes our, our, our credibility. And, uh, and so even before the withdrawal, this was happening. And, and by the way, through multiple administrations. So, I'm I'm no fan of President Biden and administration. I think they're they're horrific and, and treasonous. But uh, this was this goes back through the the, the Trump administration. Yeah. And uh, you know, and President Trump, I, I think, was very unaware of some of this stuff. Uh, and he surrounded himself by a lot of the wrong people when it comes to this stuff. And uh, you know, I hope if he if he has the the opportunity to get back in, that he learned his lesson and surround himself by uh, people that actually care about this country. It it blows my mind that. I mean, I maybe shouldn't blow my mind, but like, you know, private companies like we have, like, you know, in a capitalism mm -hmm. type society, we have an incentive to make things better, faster, you know, more efficient mm -hmm. to improve. And so, of course, the government, there is no desire, like there is no incentive to make that paperwork go from two years down to one or from eight years down to one. Like there's no incentive. So no. nobody cares. Right. This is the DMV problems, whatever. But I don't understand why the government 
I don't know, can't bring in entrepreneurs to like, hey, you're in, you know, you're in charge of this. You just ran Apple for 10 years. We're going to pay you twice as much to come <laughs> fix the DMV or we're going to pay you, you know, and, and, why and it would be cheaper, happen? right? It would be cheaper, be cheaper yeah. because, uh, because they, they, the government solves a problem by hiring more people. Yeah. They have the, the I mean, the VA is the perfect example. It's the second biggest government institution next to the department of defense. Mm. And it is so broken. I yeah. mean, it, anybody that goes to the VA will tell you like, it's one of the worst experiences of, of their life. It's, I mean, sure, they do help some people in this. I'm not saying everybody who works for the VA is bad people. There's some good people that work for the VA, but as an institution, mm -hmm. it is completely broken. If it, it it wouldn't it wouldn't survive in in the civilian world, you take the government uh, government side away and it made a civilian entity, uh, any good CEO would kill it the next day. Like this, shut it down, liquidate everything, start over. Yeah, uh, it's it's that bad. And uh, but a civilian entity could stand up and 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 solve that problem for. Yeah. probably tenth of the cost and, and actually have some good customer satisfaction, which yeah. would be great for our veterans. And who and who fills the gap in? NGOs. Non so the American taxpayers pay twice. I love that we, we get I raise about eight million dollars a year to do Mighty Oaks. I've, I've raised about fifty million dollars since I started Mighty Oaks doing veterans care. I'm very thankful to our donors and I hope this doesn't hurt me in my fundraising. Yeah. But I'll tell you like you're paying twice. I don't because they pay it in taxpayers for a job the government can't do yeah, because yeah. the government can't do it. They had the, the America, the, there's a need out there and people care about veteran suicide and care about a, uh, our, our troops because we have a patriotic country that loves our, our troops. And so they turn around and say, okay, the government's not doing the job. We're going to donate to Mighty Oaks. And then we, Mighty Oaks turns around and solves the problem. Uh, you know, it's, it's happening right here in, uh, in, in Maui with the fires. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's NGOs out here doing a job that the yep. governments won't do. I've been, I've been to Ukraine, uh, for the last, uh, I did ten trips last year to Ukraine. My uh, my team's out there continuously right now. We're in Peru. We're in we're in all, all over the world doing things that our government won't do. Afghanistan, right? I mean, we didn't get to it yet, but when the response to Afghanistan, our government left thousands of Americans behind. All our all of our, uh, you know, when when President Biden made this decision, first of all, he moved out all our military and closed our military base before we, before we withdrew Americans, before we withdrew our interpreters, our allies, before we shut down our embassy, and before we removed $85 billion in equipment. He did all that before, completely backwards. And then he gave the NEO operation, non-combatant evacuation operation, took it away from the Department of Defense and gave it to the State Department. And Secretary Blinken's job is not to do that. They treated the HKI airport like an embassy, it didn't allow our military to leave and go evacuate people. Basically, they had to make it there themselves, gave out a perimeter to the Taliban and created a scenario to where Americans couldn't evacuate, our allies couldn't evacuate, $85 billion in equipment got left behind, and people started being mass, you know, mass killings across the country, like overnight. They knew it was going to happen, by the way. I don't think this was a mistake at all. Yeah. Uh, they knew that it was going to happen that way, and I, don't, I couldn't tell you the motivation of why, again. Uh, but, um, but who had to respond to that? NGOs. And, uh, and you know, and, uh, and it was... Very uh, shameful uh, to see our country, uh, our government re create a scenario like that. And while I was ashamed of what happened, I I've never been more proud of my life to see good patriotic Americans from the veteran community stand up and do the right thing when our government wouldn't, and uh, and, and and help you know yeah. people that that couldn't help themselves. We're, yeah, we're we're dealing that with in Maui a little bit right now with things like you know like the permit process in Maui was already and just Hawaii is just horrendous anyway. It's been a, it's been mm -hmm. a corrupt, horrible thing for decades, right? And very. Uh, just rough. But now, you know, they issue, I think I heard the stat, it was like they issue 100 build, building permits for like housing a year. We have 2,000 homes to build. Right. Like, yet to improve the process of the permit, like they're not, they, they won't improve the process. They won't even invite in private companies to come talk to them right. uh, or the contractors who are the ones doing the work. They won't, they shut all the doors. They won't do it. They're like, oh, we'll, we'll deal with this. We'll fix it. Nothing's getting done. And so like, you can't build a house. I mean, we're looking at the California fires. There are thousands of them, homes burned down. They've rebuilt 50 of them, 60 yeah. of them. Like, it's just such a long process. So we're looking at that, like, we're, okay, fine. The government can't help. So, you know, we founded a, mm -hmm. or, uh, a nonprofit called Mackay, like my Mackay Foundation. And it's like, okay, our, our goal is to get these homes rebuilt. And it may have to be the ex at the expense of building homes. I'm not saying we're gonna do this. I'm not going yeah. on record saying this, but building homes without permits. Mm -hmm. And then waiting for them to shut us down and then putting that on the front page of the newspaper and saying, these people are homeless. There's thousands of them. Mm -hmm. Here's a bunch of homes we just built for them and we gave it to them. And you're going to kick them out on the street again? Mm -hmm. Like, is that where you're, that, that's the plan? And it, it's, it, how do you, how do you deal with that? I and mean, you do it on a daily <laughs> basis. How do you, how, daily basis, how do you deal with that level of incompetency of the government? 
uh, and, and maintain the faith to keep going. Well, I, I speak out against it. That, that's kind of my, <laughs> my venting. And, uh, and, and probably while well, I'm not super popular, my, I, they shadow banning on social, <laughs> yeah, media, you and, uh, social media. And, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, State Department hates me right now. But, you know, I, I do everything I do, like decision I make. I, I try not to make emotional decisions. All this stuff is very emotional. Uh, I try to make very calculated decisions uh, on how we're going to implement our organization and then uh, and, and make sure it's a real need that no one else can meet. We have another organization called Fourth Option. That's a rescue organization for people trapped around the world. And, and the reason we call uh, I'm, I'm saying that to say the name. The fourth option really is when, when Americans are in need around the world uh, in dangerous situations. The first option is uh, diplomacy. Second is military action. Third is covert action. And there's no fourth option. And so one of our decision processes there, if the, if the government can't or won't, then we will. Uh, that's kind of, and so anytime I do anything in the international, I kind of look at that, like it, the, the government can't or won't, then we will, then we will. Uh, and so, uh, and you know, look at something like Maui, you know, can they, of course they can, uh, you know, so why won't they, I don't know, but uh, I could tell you like the, the, I look at this situation and I, you know, I'm, I'm right down the road and I hadn't been there yet and I plan on going to see without getting in the way before I leave. And we have some of our team there right now, but you look, you look at the inefficiencies in the spending. Uh, Ukraine, hundreds of billions of dollars went to Ukraine. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen they made a they made a uh, a mathematical error, like I think like two months ago, and they had overpaid the Ukrainians six billion dollars, and so they wrote it off. They set up, you know, uh, hey, whoops, just whoops. let let them keep it, let let them keep it. That's six billion dollars. Somebody did the math on it, so I can't validate. Yeah. It. I had to do the math. Somebody did the math and said that six billion dollars would have rebuilt every home. Yes. In, in Maui, that yeah, I've heard the out. number five billion would rebuild all yeah. of Lahaina and yeah. every home completely. But instead, they gave them seven hundred seven hundred dollars. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, exactly. And, uh, bucks. So it's like it's like yep. the inefficiencies of our tax yep. dollars in it. And you know, you're a business guy, and, and I'm you know I'm, I'm the CEO of an organization, and the government holds me responsible to. Sp to manage this yep. $8 million a year that, that citizens entrust me with to make sure I'm doing what I'm going to say to do with it. Uh, any CEO, their shareholders or their you know, partners make sure, but yeah. there's no responsibility yeah. within our government and this spending and it's, and it's out of control. So when I underpay and, my taxes <laughs> by a few hundred thousand dollars, I hope the government lets me write that off. Too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and it's just, there's, there's no accountability. It's out of control. Yeah. And, uh, and, and honestly, you know, a lot of people that are in the finance that I talk to say that they don't even believe it's recoverable. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we just, you know, we spend money where we shouldn't be spending money. We don't spend money where we should. And, uh, you know, and our government has, has become untrustworthy. And this is regardless of what political side you sit on, by the yeah. way. Like if you're conservative, liberal, it doesn't matter. But, I mean, I don't think anybody has a full trust in, in our government right yeah. now. And when something like this happens in, in, in Maui, you wonder why all these conspiracies come up. And I don't believe some of them are conspiracies personally. But, yeah. uh, but it, you know, people are like, oh, these crazy conspiracies. And, you know, I should paint my roof blue and whatever. <laughs> why, why, why are people saying that? Because they don't... They, for whatever, don't you know, trust. for good reasons, we don't trust our government anymore. Yeah. And, hey, uh, what's what's the quote you say sometime, Alex, about the Taleb? It's like, don't confuse something for stupidity. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, Hanlon's razor, okay. never attribute to malice what could be more attributable to stupidity. Yeah. yeah. It's like people aren't evil. They're really just dumb. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and there are obviously evil people, <laughs> yeah. but I like that. Like when I think of the Maui situation, I'm like, it's not necessarily people are out there going, I, we don't want Helms rebuilt. We want Maui, you know, to suffer. Yeah. No, they're just People out of their debt, like just completely out of their debt. Like yeah. they don't know what they're doing. It's the government used to have half of the government used to run on fiscal responsibility. Yeah. Now nobody runs on fiscal responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> so there's none coming. Yeah. yeah. To your point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and some things, uh, I will say the Afghanistan thing, they, they're pointing to incompetence, but I, I don't believe there was incompetence there. I believe those are deliberate decisions mm -hmm. made knowing what they're, knowing what the results was going to be. And uh, that's my, that's, you know, my take from, from it because there was so many like again you had all the advisors saying one thing and yeah. you had one person decided to do different that's early or late you mean to leave afghanistan or to go in to leave oh. to leave yeah yeah, yeah to leave uh, so go, going into you know i'm not a, yeah. i look back i look back i believe going in afghanistan was the right thing i believe going in iraq was the wrong thing mm. uh, that's my that's my my assessment go looking back what do you think what's your opinion <laughs> Agreed or no? You want to do a whole new podcast on American <laughs> foreign policy? I have no, thoughts. We haven't, we haven't had no, your I, interview I, I, yet. We'll get at to the time, I would, I would have, I would have, uh, I would have been for Iraq, but I was, I was younger, less, less, less uh, aware of things from a national security standpoint, yeah. and, I, and I, I was a little more naive, uh, I think back then. But uh, Afghanistan, I was hundred percent, and still, still am today. Wait, that was, a, yeah, yeah. What do you think, Alex? It is very hard. It is very murky. It's hard to give single answer, yeah, yeah. but I. I would 
not have gone to either. And then once we went, I would have not have left either. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of yeah, where I went. Leaving Al Assad, especially, uh, it was, yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. We should not have left. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was the same thing. I wasn't as big of a news thing as peace, yeah. but Al Assad was not much different than, than, uh, than the, the, the surrender of Afghanistan. So how did you go from, okay, we got to get Aziz out. We got his family. He's got a bunch of kids. What, six kids? Is that six right? kids, yeah. Yeah, we got to get them out. And I know the, the book talks, he has a great story. I mean, it's phenomenal writing about like how that process went. But how did you go from we got to get this guy out yeah. to 17,000 people that you helped get out? Like that's a... <laughs> yeah, yeah, big jump. Yeah. Well, for, you know, we were we put this team together. Luckily, I got some great friends. Uh, I found, you know, former special operations guys who were no longer in, but had the experience to do it. Not the guys that would still be gung, gung-ho to go and fight the Taliban, like guys that had got the each other system, the right guys, and guys that had, you know that could help me on the campaign side too. Tim Kennedy, you know, was yeah, yeah. great experience as a special forces guy, longtime friend of mine, has a platform because we have to raise a lot of money. Uh, him, uh, some buddies, you know, Force Recon guys and Green Berets and Navy SEALs, some guys from CIA Ground Branch paramilitary unit that I've knew, known. Like bringing all those guys together, uh, we brought twelve guys and this lady named Sarah Verardo, who's amazing, uh, and we put together this team to go get as just as easy as wife and six kids. And then as we're putting this effort together, one of the guys said, "Hey, this three thousand orphans just got left," and that changed everything for us. Mm-hmm. We we're like, "Hey." This is great, we're, but we have this experience. All of us had this burden in our heart to do the right thing. And we were already itching with like, what should we do? How much should we help? And we we're in that moment, we decided, hey, let's give many Americans, interpreters, their families, women and children, uh, Christians, every person, as many people as we can. And I believe like, got a lot of accolades for doing this, uh, a lot of pats on the back. But the truth is like, I'm not smart enough or capable enough to pull this off. This, the only way I could attribute to the to what happened was uh, this is a miraculous. Uh, orchestrated event by God because mm-hmm. again I, the things that happen a series event that happen none of us could have pulled that off I could try to do it a million more times and <laughs> wouldn't pull it off one 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 time uh, we said yes I think we were obedient to that prompting God put in our heart we called the we, it was the Mighty Oaks that started the Save Our Allies Coalition we stood up the Save Our Allies uh, 51C3 and, and, and uh, called it Task Force 68 from Isaiah 68 hear my send me we lean forward to do that because of that burden that God put in our hearts, and, and I believe God just orchestrated this miracle we're all part of. The first being that we got permission to go in HKIA to evacuate civilians as as, as civilians. You got to remember the military was not allowing uh, the military to do that because the White House had taken away the new operation and gave this the the State Department, so they weren't allowed to do it. So for us to get permission was a miracle in itself. And she went, Sarah went to General Milley's office and asked for permission. And he got it. I, I, I still to this day don't know how it happened. We also got a, we also got our own air strip. So all these other NGOs, and, and by the way, I'm not putting any of that. There's some great NGOs there, but we were the only ones that had, got permission to go on the ground. So okay. other people were like WhatsApp and calling and stuff like that, and they were coordinating with us. But we were the only ones that got the permission to actually go on the ground there. And uh, I always tell Sarah like. I want to see these pictures. You have a general Billy like in high heels or something. Like, how do you get permission from <laughs> uh, <yeah>. the? <laughs> uh, so, so th- that happened, and then now we're going to move civilians without visas because these are visa applicants. Yep. Uh, SIVs, P one, P twos. We're going to move people without visas across a country border. Like, that's illegal. That's human trafficking. So we need a place to bring them. And the only place you could do that is in Laredo, Texas, right? But in the rest of the world, you have to have permission <laughs> to bring people across the border. Yeah, yeah if you're down there, just march them across the border. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. But, so we called the yeah. we had you had to contact the royal family of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, one of our recon marines they grew up with uh, actually grew up with one of the princes there. Wow. And we we I got a couple of congressmen on the phone, senators, uh, and we we got this big phone call. And I briefed it. Everybody was quiet. I'm thinking these people think I'm crazy. And then they, at the end of the call, they they said yes, we're going to roll out the corporate you can bring them to the humanitarian center which made it legal now uh and uh we're gonna give you oh also gonna give you a c-17 plane large military plane if you fill it up we'll give you another one but then i realized like man this is gonna cost millions of dollars and not thousands like yeah. i'm gonna have to do how are we gonna raise money to make this happen and literally that that was day three i got a uh, unsolicited call from glenn beck who's a friend of mine mercury one we've uh, we've done a lot of things together i'm sure everybody a lot of people listening know who glenn beck is yeah he got on the radio and tried to do something like he just wanted to do something. He spoke out and thought he'd raise a few thousand dollars. We had already raised in three days 20-something million dollars. Jeez. Ultimately, he raised like $46 million. He's like, I don't know what to do with it. Like, I got this money. I want to help, but what do I do with it? And, uh, and I'm like, I need you to start chartering planes. And he put a guy named Rudy Atala in charge from Mercury One, and they start chartering planes. And so for the first 10 days there, ground team, our team in Abu Dhabi, like our team in Washington, D.C., like everybody was just getting after it. If you stopped for like five minutes, literally, like you were trading someone's life 
for five minutes of sleep. That that literally, like my friend Seaspray lost 37 pounds uh, in 10 days because he would not stop going out of the wire and uh, to get people like it forced hydrating him. And uh, and at that ended at 10 days, the Abigate was suicide bomber hit the Abigate, killed 13 of our service members, which did not need to happen. Uh, 170 Afghans were killed, hundreds of others were injured. Uh, the military is forced to weld the gate shut. We had got, we had not only got Aziz's family out at that time, we had got 12,000 people out. We chose to stay because the military was forced to leave, which they did not want to leave, by the way. Last thing they had to do was clean the, clean the airport, including the bathrooms to turn it over to Taliban, which people think I'm exaggerating by that, but it, you could ask any military guy that was there. They were literally told to, to scrub the graffiti of, uh, of to anti-Taliban graffiti which had to be a hell of a job because if you had been in a military porta potty, <laughs> <laughs> like everything would have fit the Taliban. Uh, uh, There's a lot of, uh, you know, penis pictures uh, yeah. race that day. And, uh, but, but, uh, so that was the last thing our military is humiliating to do, but we didn't have to leave. And there's a couple of reasons we stayed, but one was that the white house was saying there was a hundred Americans left. I was saying there was thousands. Uh, now we know from the Senate hearings that I was right. There was thousands of Americans, uh, the White House math was saying, hey, we had 16,000 Americans there, which I don't think they ever knew the number anyway. We got we got 6,000 out, and now there's 100 left. I'm not that great at math, but <laughs> that's, that's not 100, right? So, uh, But the truth is, it doesn't matter. If it was 1,000 or 100, you don't leave one American behind, yeah. ever. And that's a promise that the, the president had made. Yeah. It's a promise that American people should always have. Uh, where I come from, it was scorched the earth to go get American left. I, rem- I remember that back when that happened. And, you know, we, there are pictures of people hanging out on planes and falling off planes trying to get out, right? I remember that. And I remember the attitude of, hey, there's only a hundred left or a few hundred yeah. left. And like I remember thinking at the time, like, wait, when did America turn into it's only a hundred left, we're yeah. fine, instead of like no one left behind? No like, one. And they yeah. were like, well, people don't want to leave. Well, So the people don't want to leave thing is, is, is ridiculous because remember the state department had the neo operation. So that meant that they gave the Taliban out of perimeter to check passports to come into the airport. Mm. And anybody knows that controls the, any kind of knows anything about ground space, whoever controls out of perimeter controls in, in yeah. ingress, egress of that ground space. So now some 20 year old American who went there to teach, to work at a humanitarian aid, teaching a, like English, work in a hospital missionary. She has to show her blue passport to a Taliban a monster who's murdering people in the street to get through. She's not going to do that. Who would do that? Right. So we, we left those people behind those Americans behind. We abandoned them and, uh, and, and told them that, well, they mustn't want to come. You know, no, they, I mean, the, le- the, the best way to describe the level of chaos that it's not the people falling off the planes was these ladies. Imagine a mom with their baby and, and, they, and they're so scared that they're, their son's going to become this baby. Son's going to become a Taliban being forced to Madras. So their daughter's going to be, uh, become sexual slave the rest of her life, be sold off at like you know nine years old. So they love this baby so much that they literally kiss it goodbye and put it on the top of a crowd of 100,000 people to be crowd surfed like a beach ball to that wall. When it gets to the wall, somebody grabs the baby because they all are kind of in on this. They grab the baby and throw it as hard and as high as they can over that wall, hoping a service member catches it. What they didn't know was on the other side of that wall was about six feet high and 20 feet deep of constantino wire. My buddy Joe counted six babies that had bled out in that wire. Like that level of desperation was going on at the airport. Wow. And, uh, and, you know, we created that by, by creating that scenario. Uh, and we had several opportunities. I can't say what they are cause they're redacted in the book, not because they're classified because they're political. And mm-hmm. I would say that, you know, Pentagon redacted parts of that book. We had several opportunities to change trajectory and, and the, in the white house inter not only said no, they intervened to stop it. And, and again, those are redacted in there. And I, and I will say those, in my opinion, those are not classified. Th- those are political things that they redacted out of this book. Um, and you could, hopefully people could read between the lines, but w- we chose to stay. We led a coalition at a place called Mazda Sharif, got another 5,000 people out. And, uh, and, and at that point we had, they had moved all the women and children, as many women and children as they could, to a place called the Panjir Valley. And the commandos that we left behind who were being hunted down and killed were trying to get their women and children out so they'd go back and resist and fight. And they were going to, we heard they were going to cross them across the, the Panjir river into Tajikistan. And when I heard that I used to operate in an area, uh, 25,000 foot mountain peaks. The Panjir border is like a thousand foot cliff in some parts. Crazy terrain. And they're going to cross a river. Afghan women, half of them are usually pregnant, one. <laughs> and, and none of them could swim because even Afghan men barely could swim, but women never yeah. swam before, right? So they're going to cross the Panjir River, category five rapids, ice melt water, like 
it's a death sentence to do that. In addition to that, the Taliban was on that border, the Tajikistan military, Chinese military, Chinese special operations forces were there, uh, the Russian military, mechanized convoys of Russian. The news didn't report any of this. And they're going to try to move this. So we knew that we had to be able to provide routes to tell them where to cross, how to cross, and facilitate that crossing for them. So myself and a, and a Marine named Staff Sergeant Dennis Price, Force Recon Marine, Scout Sniper, like amazing dude, he wanted to come. He was still in the, he had just switched to reserves from active duty. He was like the right guy to come. And I was like, man, you're going to get in trouble. You go. So I called his commander, Lieutenant Colonel Tommy Waller, who I, I know well. And I, and I said, uh, hey, will you let Staff Sergeant Price come? He's like, I don't know. Put it in writing. I did. And he, they approved it. And uh, so he got to approve to go. He's like the only service member that got to be part of this. Uh, me and him went, flew into Tajikistan. It's a long story. I won't, you can read it in the book, but we yeah. made it 10 hours or 12 hours through the mountains, got to the border. We spent 10 hours on that. Uh, t- I'm sorry. We spent 10 days on that border, did about 90 miles of border reconnaissance. And every night we swam across the Panjia River to build routes out for those women and children and you know, stage rope bridges and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and then for them women and children to get out and that's kind of, they got them out. Well, we don't know how many got out and, and how they use it. We, we yeah. built the routes and yeah. provide the information to, to some of our government agencies, to NGOs, to the, to the commandos. Uh, and there was more to it that, it, you know, I won't say, but, uh, yeah. but, but it was a successful, a successful operation. And, uh, and that, that's how it ended for us. And, uh, well, it, and, and actually as I say, that's how it ended for us. We're still, involved i can't say what we're doing but we're still involved because you know some about these guys fought with us for 20 years yeah and uh and fought beside us for 20 years we owe it to do everything we can and still still working on efforts to get them out wow i mean the the book and the stories in there they read like a you know a you know um jack Carr novel you know i mean they read yeah. like a modern like crazy fiction story did this stuff really happen and so what what that leads to is like i know they're making a movie about this as well, right? They are, yeah. We uh, so we had when the book came out, we had several offers. I was super skeptical and scared yeah. to give it away because uh, it's not my story. It's yeah. the story of uh, yeah. I believe first of all, I believe it's God's story for performing this miracle, but it's also a story of uh, you know, everybody that was involved in, in the story of these Afghans and a story that represents these twenty million women, little girls. I mean, why do we swim yeah. across the river? Because little nine-year-old girls are being drugged off and to be sexually enslaved and married off to 50-year-old men and yeah. and uh, their story needs to be told. So I was like super, like who am I going to give this to that I could trust that's going to do it justice? And uh, I certainly didn't want a, a payday for it or anything like that. It's, I did not mind to do that with. And so I, I um, we passed on a couple of very big name studios and went to uh, a guy that I knew I could trust with it and they raised them. They were going to spend a couple of months trying to do the raise to get about thirty million dollar budget, and they raise it in eight hours. Wow! Uh, so it's funded. Uh, I can't say who's writing this, who wrote the script, yeah. and uh, and and produced it, but it's uh, everyone probably everyone recognizes it. You know the name, yeah. I tell you. But uh, but uh, e- uh, I think everyone yeah. recognizes. Uh, it's a great team, I can't and wait. they had yeah. the right. They had the right. They they really care about doing it right. They they thought this was a sacred thing, and uh, they care about doing it right. I negotiated in, and they didn't push back at all to be a, a producer okay. to oversee the military. I, I've never done this before, but yeah. what about oversee the military piece and make sure that piece is done right and authentic? And they didn't even they didn't even negotiate. They were like, "Yeah, oh, you should do it. We want you to do it." And so, so I'm very very happy to be working with uh, wow. the wow the team that's going to be doing it. All right, man. Uh Amazing stuff. I want to keep going, but I want to get into a little bit more about you personally and some of your story. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we rewind a few years. You know, when you left, and you talk about this in the book a little bit. I know you've got other books as well. Uh, when you left, why did you leave Afghanistan as a, as, a, as a soldier? Why did you leave there? I know PTSD was involved there. What was that story, and what was that like getting back? Yeah, well, when Bashir flipped on us, um, you know, things went really sideways. I, I had, at that time, I think it was, uh, that was towards the end of my deployments. And uh, when I had been abducted by a foreign intelligence agency um, and tried to go back and continue to operate, I started having panic attacts in mm-hmm. theater. Uh, so now I'm operating this high-level special operations missions with severe panic attacks. I was trying to hide it uh, and uh, it was not going well. I mean, um, and so eventually I had this moment where some uh, I realized I was putting other people in danger by not dealing with this and I, and I came home I actually long story how I came home I pretty much had to uh, evacuate from the area I was in because I was in a, I was in another country and by myself so I had to do this kind of E and E and E out of this uh, country and, and get back and I came home and was put before a clinical class psychologist I was diagnosed with severe chronic PTSD and subsequently was read out of called read out of my program meaning I couldn't do my job anymore and uh, that was devastating to me first of all the panic attacks were like 
Unless somebody's had panic attacks before, it's really hard to describe. Like I literally believed I was dying in that moment every mm. time. Like a, like imagine drowning to death, and but you never die. Like you're in that state of panic 24 seven. And the medicine they gave me, some of the medicine made me feel like I was being poisoned and killing me. Other medicine made me feel like a zombie. Uh, on top of that, I was completely ashamed, embarrassed because, you know, I'd worked my whole life to be in this job, had a lot of pride in this job, and and now I felt like I let everyone down, and so I was just embarrassed, and uh, and and then I ended up. Uh, my coping was getting on those mats again and doing jujitsu, which I know we shared that. And, yeah. and I've been on the mats 43 years now. So I always say when I'm speaking, wow. I was like, it wasn't something new to me. I say I did it since I was little, but I'm still a little, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little guy. And, uh, yeah, I, I just love jujitsu, but I was actually worried that, um, cause I always felt like I was like about to have a heart attack. Like people have panic attacks. They kind of believe they're having a heart attack. So I was kind of scared to push myself physically. But when I got on his mats the first time, it was like I found a cure. Like you can't, because mm. you're mentally present. You can't think about Afghanistan yep. and, and grapple at the same time. Your yep. buddy's going to beat you up. So something about, that's one of the things I love most about jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu and skydiving, those two things, like I could run, I could swim, I could lift weights and do kettlebells. And I'm thinking about like a million things. My mind's yep. always working like I'm like planning a new operation or whatever. But when I'm in jiu-jitsu and when I'm skydiving, I'm mentally present in that moment. Yep. And I love that about that, those two things. You, so, do you surf at all? Because surfing's the same uh, yeah, thing to yeah, me. Yeah, like, yeah, I, 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 I find I, that. I do, but like, like surfing, I, I feel like I get it in like the moment I'm on. I'm yeah, trying when to, you're riding, riding, but yep. I'm out in the water and I'm like, yep. but like in jujitsu, I just feel like if I'm there for an hour and a half, yep. like I just don't think about anything else for an hour and a half. When I'm at the drop zone, I actually I never could put my phone away. My wife calls me my pacemaker because if it leaves it, she says I'm gonna die. Like when I go to the drop <laughs> zone, I put my phone in my bag and I forget it there. Yeah. And when that same thing at jujitsu, so like, I, like I just. I, like I got on those mats and I felt like I found a cure and, and, uh, and you know, you could have a medicine for being sick and you could abuse that medicine as well. And jujitsu was good for me, but I abused that medicine and I mm. didn't get well. I just stayed on those mats 24 seven and, 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 and put away like what was, what had been broken inside of me. And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, I still, like I said, I'm not speaking bad about jujitsu with that cause I love jujitsu still. And it's very helpful for me. We talk about, we talk in the military a lot, but these four pillars of resiliency, mind, body, spirit, social. And I think, you know, the, the jujitsu covers, you know, mind, not just body, but mind, body, social, it covers those things except the spiritual piece. And, uh, but three of those pillars are covered just in jujitsu. But, but, um, and like I said, I love it so much. So even when I have a bad, working with veterans is extreme. Running nonprofits is extremely stressful. When I have a bad day, I go to the gym and I find like some twenty year old stud. I choke yeah. him out. <laughs> it out. Makes me, makes me feel better. Like it's the best feeling. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I love it. But I took that thing and I abused it and it never got well. And I spent about three years. What looked like on a surface like an upward trajectory because I was like, I won a world title. I won. I was an inaugural champion for Legacy FC. I, uh, I, I, fought, you know, I fought for the main event of Bellator, Strike Force, World Series wow. of Fighting. Like, I ended up being eighteen and two as a professional with seventeen submissions. So that's for a jiu-jitsu guy that can't get any yeah. better than that. And uh, was ranked number six in the world as a flyweight, and I think number twenty three or something like that as a bantamweight. So I was. It looked on the surface, it was great. I had thousand students in my jiu-jitsu school that I only had for like three years, but my personal life was like crashing. Yeah, I was gonna ask, what did it do to your marriage? Yeah, I mean, time? my marriage fell apart. I, I ended up. Uh, I ended up just into just complete set, completely like in the same home separated from my wife uh just a totally tyrant to my family uh i mean i just you know throw temper tantrums like a 15 year old boy like slam doors mm -hmm. punch holes in the wall break things screaming at my wife and kids like i was just totally i had no control of my emotions and i had no empathy i think that had turned off like years ago in afghanistan so i'd see my wife crying i'm like the heck's wrong with me i don't even feel bad that my wife's crying i just like broke her heart and i don't even feel bad about it like something's wrong with me like I, so I was just in this really dark place and separated myself from my family emotionally at the time. I remember like, I think this is during the deployments. I remember coming home from Afghanistan and probably when I first had the biggest wake up call that I was like that emotionally detached was my daughter had a birthday party and, and uh, she, she had a, she's very opinionated she, as a kid and even more so now, but she didn't like the icing on her cake, like something super simple. And I picked up my little girl's birthday cake and threw it against the wall and destroyed my little girl's birthday. Wow. And I remember thinking like, what kind of dad, like what kind of person behaves that way? What kind of dad behaves that way? But I was like that out of control. And instead of like admitting I was wrong, I would just double down. Like, yeah, that was out of control, but you guys are all idiots. Like, <laughs> like I was justify everything. And so I just distanced myself instead of getting better. And, and eventually, like uh, like I said, after the three-year downward spiral, I found myself uh, in an affair. We sold our home. My wife filed for divorce. We uh, got two separate leases on 12-month leases on apartments. My wife and I had two different reactions. My wife went to this church uh, and really got around some good, solid people. And she would say that she would go in there, not just on Sundays, but like during the week, and she'd pray for me. Like, 
you with it. Well, I'm doing that to her. What she'd be praying, and she'd pray like, God, let me see Chad the way you see Chad, and let me love Chad the way you love mm-hmm. Chad. Let me forgive Chad the way you forgave Chad. That's what she was doing for me. And meanwhile, I'm like complete degenerate. I'm like bachelor pad. I don't have to worry about this woman anymore. She never understood me anyway. You know what I was going through, and and uh, took a big fight on Strike Force on Showtime, and I was like totally focused on that. We we're separated for like three months, and you know, uh, training girls like. And then I, you know, I fight in this big fight, and I win this fight in Toyota Center, like ten thousand people in there, and I go home, and I'm like, I remember like standing in the ring, and my hands raised, and and like thinking like, of all these ten thousand people, and not one of them was my wife, and and uh, and I just fought so hard to win this other stupid fight, which I love the sport, but it was in context, right? I'm fighting so hard to win this fight, trained for three months, put everything into it, diet and all this stuff, and and I, I go home that night and thinking like, man, you know, why can't I fight for this? you know my family and I and I found myself laying in my apartment and this thought came over me you know um made my family be sad without me but they would be better off and uh you know that same hopeless thought finds a home in the hearts of over 20 veterans every single day and uh and and uh you know many veterans think that they're not taking their lives because they're escaping their pain but they think they're making it better for the people around them and nothing could be further from the truth the wake of devastation and destruction that um that suicide leaves behind you know one in one one in every three children from a parent that commits suicide will do it as well really yeah and yeah so it's Shit. it's generational and it becomes like it becomes you you teaching wow. the people behind you mm-hmm. you know when i get to a rock bottom here's here's a solution that dad had you know and yeah. especially when the father does it i mean obviously you see ronda rousey you know father committed suicide and she always spoke against it anti-suicide 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 and how terrible it was what her dad did she loses her belt she goes on Ellen DeGeneres show and they say, what was your thoughts after that? I went home and went to kill myself. Because yeah. she lost a belt. Why? Because her dad taught her that that's the solution, that's the solution. at rock bottom, right? So, uh, you know, so I, I would re- I really believe that that was the best solution for my family and I think many, many veterans do and I almost became that other veteran suicide statistic. I, I was sitting in my closet in my apartment I put my family pictures on the floor around me and I, I Glock 22 pistol and I put it against my head. And I, I think it was one thing that was like, I believe this was divine because every time I put that gun to my head, and it was, I would even think like, I would even sort of like, I think the angle, like, cause I didn't want to feel it. And, uh, but then I had this thought of who was going to find me. Like, cause you know, I'm in an apartment. Somebody's going to hear a gunshot or you're not going to show up somewhere. And the only other person that had a key to my apartment at the time besides me was my son Hunter. He was 13 at the time. And I thought, man, I, my son, I can't let my son find me this way. And that was enough to pump the brakes for that moment. But I was in such a dark place. I was still trying to like justify it. And I, and I, I was in my closet. And I, had, I wouldn't, it didn't have the gun in my head, but I had the gun on the floor next to me. I was picking it up and, uh, and I heard a knock on my door and I wasn't going to answer it. But when I heard my wife's voice announce herself, I panicked. Uh, I, if she was my apartment, my closet, she would have never came in. But for some reason I was probably so ashamed that I hid the gun under a blanket and I, and I ran to the door and this may sound twisted, but I was so mad that she was there interrupting me, killing myself without me inviting her there that I opened the door and just started berating her, yelling at her. And, and in the middle, and she's not a very calm arguer, by the way, <laughs> but, but in that moment, she was actually pretty calm. And she asked me a question that changed my life and not only changed my life, probably saved my life. She, she asked me, she's like, how could you do all these things you've done? Well, we met when we were 17 and 18. She saw me become a recon Marine schools, training deployments, fights, like doing, you know, 20 professional MMA camps, like cutting weight. I, I lose like 35 pounds, like bones in my face. Look like a making fly weight like I look like a holocaust victim mm-hmm. and she's like she's seen all this discipline she's like how can you do all of that and when it comes to your family you'll quit and uh you know to me there's no more soul cutting word to be called the quitter, quitter and, yeah. yeah and so she was she was absolutely right I've been successful at professional things when it came to the most important things like being a husband being a father being a young 17 year old kid that you know raised his hand when he'd given a second chance at life I quit in all those things including my will to live and I'm a pretty radical decision maker and in that moment I made a, a decision to get back in the fight I didn't know I didn't know how uh, but I knew I couldn't do it with the people I'd surrounded myself by in my jiu-jitsu school. No offense to any of them, but like I, I was a black belt. I had a thousand students and everybody told me everything I wanted to hear and not what I needed to hear. I didn't have any accountability and there's no more dangerous place on this planet, uh, especially for men, than more dangerous than Peshawar or Pakistan or, or, or Afghanistan, like than for a man to be without accountability uh, and because uh, we're our own worst enemies. And uh, I mean, we could be killed in the battlefield, but you could, you'd be killed, you'd be, you'd be killed by, you know, by your own self, by your own hands back, you know, without accountability. And I had none. And so I, I asked my wife at this, this church you're going to, is there some man that can hold me accountable to this decision? I want somebody outside of my circle. I didn't care about her church. In fact, I was pretty, uh, very skeptical of any religion or, or anything like that. I just want somebody outside of my, of my circle. And so she introduced this man that was on call, elder on call at the church. His name was Steve Toth. 
We met at a Starbucks coffee shop. And uh, Steve was an MMA fighter, never served in the military. He was a, he's a state legislator now, but at that time he owned a local pool company and just was volunteering as, as elder to church. And I had written a five paragraph order, like an ops order of how I was going to fix my life, a military ops order. And it was, it was really good. And I was like super proud of it. And I wanted, I'm, now I'm in manipulation mode, right? I want to win my wife back. So I want to show it to him. So he tells her about it and I slid it over to him. And he didn't even read it. He slides it back over to me and tells me I'm going to fail. I'm being like super offended. I'm like, this guy didn't even read it. He's telling me I'm going to fail. But I'll never forget what he said. He tapped on the paper and he said, if this plan doesn't have anything to do with your relationship with God, I'm not going to waste your time. I'm not going to let you waste mine. And, uh, and mm-hmm. you, know, you know, I say this to, not to preach to your audience, but I can't share like my Please. story without telling you that. Like, like I had tried everything. I've been on medication. Uh, I've been on you know, all the pills and I've been through all the therapy, the VA, civilian programs. I had financial success. I had professional success. I had accolades and notoriety. Like some of those things are good and some of those things are bad, but none of those things changed my situation. And at Mighty Oaks, we have a saying that comes out of this moment. If what you're doing isn't working, then why not try something different, right? If what you're doing isn't working, you know, try something different. And so I, I was kind of, that's where I was. I was like, what do I have to lose? Uh, and so I made a decision to follow Steve's lead. He led me in a relationship with Christ. I surrendered my life to Christ. And, uh, and, and beyond that decision, what happened was to me, pretty profound to other people, maybe simple to me, it's pretty profound. What I realized was that, uh, uh, and, and so I didn't just leave, I didn't just surrender my life to, to Jesus. And that was over. Steve discipled me for a whole year. Wow. And so through that, through that process, what I realized was that all these bad things that happened to me, losing my brother, like lose, I got the band right here, Foster Harrington. He's 10 years we served together and, uh, three units together. And then he died on our first deployment and. 2004 and, and he's a uh, you know like all those things as bad as those things were losing those 15 buddies over those deployments and all those bad things I just shared some of them as bad as those things were those things did not lead me to be in that closet with my pistol in my hand what led me there were the choices that I made in response to those things and, and through this discipleship what I was learning was yeah I still got angry I still got frustrated I still felt anxiety but Steve's teaching me that the Bible had a, had a, a different uh, answer to make different decisions based on the things I was dealing with. So when I faced anxiety, I was able to have a biblical decision that led me to a different result. When I got angry, I was able to have a, bib- mm. like a, a biblical lesson that led me a different result. And I started becoming very intentional about applying these biblical principles in my life, and my life was radically changed, and that led me to a restoration in my, in my anxiety and depression, my family. I've been married for 28 years now. Wow. Uh, three adult children that are all married, two, uh, three granddaughters, uh, two went to Bible college, two served in the Marines, two work in ministry now. Uh, I have a, we just adopted our brand new baby girl summer. Like, uh, where so the restoration of our family, I found hope again. And ultimately I found what we all really need and what I've searched my whole life for. And that's, that's purpose. And the purpose really manifested for me in a deep burden. I got put on my heart to pay it forward with others. Like I didn't just want to, it was like I was dying of cancer and Steve gave me the cure. Like I wanted to share it. I felt obligated to share mm-hmm. it. And that manifested in the founding of Mighty Oaks Foundation. And over the last 12 years, like you said, we've served over half a million warriors through our resiliency program. I've given away 300 copies, thousand copies, 300,000 copies of my books to the troops and I speak all over, uh, based all over the world. And, uh, we have a podcast, a state dangerous podcast now, part of the ministry to reach out. We have a recovery programs, five ranches around the country that we do, you know, these $8 million programs too. And I'm in DC, like advocating for faith case veterans care. And president Trump had appointed me to be a chairman of the white house faith based coalition. And then we have our international program. We go to places. Uh, we have a team right now in Peru serving the Peruvian military, teaching them how to do what we do. I've been to Ukraine 10 times in the front line of Ukraine, like, uh, teaching the, those troops, we train we train the chaplains now. Mighty Oaks trains chaplains in Ukraine, mm-hmm. and uh, we've, we've rescued several people. And the, the Benjamin Hall, the Fox News reporter, it was myself and six other guys that went and rescued Benjamin Hall. And so we get to do all kind of amazing things, uh, you know, simply because we, you know, just finally decided to step forward and live the life that I believe God created us to live and do the things He created us to do. And that's well, well, I think it fits with the what was it Isaiah six eight? Is that what you said earlier about yeah. the you know here I am here I send me yeah yeah that it's attitude just being a willingness to just yeah step forward and serve and yeah. uh, and a lot goes behind that but there's a lot of things that happen to get you to a place to where you could really do that uh, everybody everybody sees that kind of life and wants to do that there's a lot that happens a lot of submission uh, through all parts of your life to be able to be in a place to really be able to do that. You know, I had a question recently. Somebody asked me. It kind of it surprised me. I'd never been asked it before, um, but it was such a great question. And I was going to make a YouTube video about it or mm-hmm. Instagram, but I think I'm just going to ask you it instead. Yeah. We'll just cut this <laughs> and put it on social media. How does somebody deepen their spirituality? Uh, and specifically, it was, it was referring to it was a Christian person said, "Hey, I've not been around it for a long, 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 mm-hmm. long time. Uh, 
I see what you're doing. I want what you have. How do I, how do I get back there? Like, how do I deepen my spiritual walk? Well, I, I get, I get this a lot cause you know, I do a lot of public speaking. Yeah. You know? I'm nothing to, I don't, I don't, I feel like I'm a normal person, but people are always like, man, I want, I want the life you have. I want to be able to go out and, and, and want to be speaking and writing books and going out around the world and help people. And I'm, and, and, uh, and I'm like, if there's anything in me, and this is my answer, if there's anything in me, you see, it's, it's, it's Jesus in me mm. that, that, cause I, I am a mess. If you knew me behind, you know, behind this mic, off this microphone, I'm a mess every day. And, and you know, the, the Christian life, by the way, it's not a life of, easy life it's a difficult life because it just comes with not only the world's opposition but now you're in a spiritual opposition especially if you make an impact right if you yeah. think military strategy at all man we're like i said to reach a half million troops uh you know not only do i want to reach those half million troops and a half million more but so does satan yeah. and so i put myself in, in a crosshair so i have to be really diligent and strong about my faith and walk and uh so how does someone someone deepen their spirituality that one first and there's no shortcut to this and uh this may sound super evangelical and it is uh there's no shortcut to that besides it begins with a relationship with jesus there's you can't get around that like you can't be deep spiritual you can't be the person you were created to be unless you have a relationship with the creator it starts there so you have to have a relationship with jesus then you have to know god's word in order to be able to implement God's word. The Bible is like, whether you're a spiritual person or not, the Bible, if you just, if you put Jesus out of it and you just lived biblical principles, you'd have a pretty amazing life. You'd be lacking the spirituality piece. You'd be lacking that, the the joy and, and, and fulfillment that comes through the relationship with Jesus, but the principles would you lead, lead you to a good place. So first, the relationship with Jesus. Secondly, is, is knowing God's word because you can't just read it like a playbook and then implement it. You have to really understand it. And that really comes through a relationship with the Holy Spirit being able to speak into your life and, and help you understand it and how to implement it. Uh, I, I think not just knowing God's word, uh, but being able to uh, take God's word and sort it in your heart, sort it in your mind, sort it in your soul. That way when you the enemy comes and he will, you're going to be able to be equipped uh, with what the Bible calls the full armor of God. Because uh, there's going to be times when you won't have the Bible. I have this thing on my, on my phone. It says uh, victory over fear verses. And I used to, when I'd struggle with anxiety and depression, I'd take this little silver pill bottle that the VA gave me. It had Ativan in it, which is like a Xanax. And it would calm me down. But then a few hours later, I'd be back to the same place. So I, I replaced that silver pill bottle with this little verse thing. And I'd read that. And, I, and so I started memorizing verses because I don't always have my phone with me, despite yeah. what my wife thinks. Uh, <laughs> and then I go to places like, so I was, I'll share a story of example of that. And I know we're probably taking long in your pocket. No, dude, uh, I, we can go all day. Okay. <laughs> That's so, great. So, uh, me and Dennis, like I said, we swam across that river every night and, and to, from Tajikistan to Afghanistan. And, uh, it sounds like super courageous, but it's, it's not. <laughs> we, we were scared to death. <laughs> um, I mean, we literally were like 30 yards from the Taliban at times and, uh, and, and out there. And, uh, but I, I, see, I have a speaking event I've been doing called Fear Not. And, uh, uh, you know, on the other side of the river was something more important than our fear. You know, it was nine year old girls that were being raped mm -hmm. and, and 20 million women. So that, that overcomes that fear. I remember driving to the airport. My wife's about to drop us off, drop me off. And I don't know if any, anybody listening has ever gotten a fight with their wife on the way to the airport, but uh, <laughs> it tends to be a time. For no, me, especially, never, never. especially, especially when we're <laughs> so like, she's like so mad. She's like, you got to ease out. You guys got like 17,000 people out. What are you doing? You're going to, I know you're going to swim across the river. I'm like, cause she's like listening and I'm like, what are you talking? Of course I'm not going to swim, <laughs> swim in Afghanistan. And she's like, I know you're going to, you know, like, why would you do that to us? You know? And I'm like, and the only way I knew how to describe it and calm her down. Cause she was, she was scared. He wouldn't, yeah. it was doing it arguing. She was scared and rightfully. And uh, I'm 40, you know, at the time I was 46 years old. And, and I, by the way, right before I went out there, I just snapped my groin muscle off the bone and my, Ooh. my foot was black cause of the blood pooling. And I had a doctor telling my wife, like you need to keep moment. He needs emergency surgery. And I'm like, I can't do that right now. And I never got surgery, but so like, she's, she's like scared. And, and, and the only way I knew to describe it to her was this, like, what if it was our yeah. kids? What if this was our sons that'd be forced into Madras? Was our daughter, Haley, that'd be raped for the rest of her life. Like, wouldn't we be praying that someone would come help us? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I know I would be. And, uh, and I felt like deep down in my heart, I knew someone on the other side of the world was praying that someone would come help them. And we had, you know, we had the opportunity, we had the ability to do it. We had the skills and experience to do it. Got a burden of hearts to do it. And, just because I wanted to as bad as I did, the right doors had to open and make it possible, and those doors were opening. And I always say when, you know, if you're getting prompted and God's burning your heart and the doors are opening, yeah. you got to go. Like, yeah. it's, not a, it's not a choice at that point. And that's why I felt like we had to go. And, and actually, Kathy kind of got it at that point. She's like, all right, she gave me her blessing, and, and, uh, and, and I went, and, and uh, she was, you know, we prayed together. And but when we got there, we, me and Dennis had this night. We were going to swim across this river, and to give an idea what we were doing, we were doing route reps. We did about 90 miles of route reps. Chinese military everywhere, Chinese special force, Chinese snipers. We'd already been shot at once. 
uh, and we were going to cross this one spot that was the perfect crossing. When you're doing these fording reps, you want to know how cold is the water, what's the, what's the speed of the water, uh, what's the gradient going in, what's the soil going in, where there was the places for covering consuming on both sides of high people, or there points to anchor rope bridges because that's where we're leaving rope bridges on the other side with the equipment because we knew the commandos are trained in that. You got to assess like what they have to build, how they're going to cross. Uh, is it too far? If it's too far, uh, yeah, it's, it's the water's less current, but it's too far for the rope bridge. Mm-hmm. If it's too narrow, now the rapids are too strong. So it has to be a perfect, like the Goldilocks spot. Yep. And we had found six of those, but one of them was the very best. But in that moment that we had to swim across to assess that, there was a Taliban checkpoint with three Taliban soldiers there. Uh, and then there was a, a Chinese BMP, a mechanized vehicle, with a PKM, a giant machine gun on the roof, and a, and a big spotlight for people swimming across the river. And we we're about to swim across that when the sun goes down. Or we were waiting for the sun to go down a while. We stripped down our underwear, you know, and, and put our clothes in cascade bags, swim across that thing unarmed, go do the assessment on the side, come back. We were about to do that. And, uh, and you know, man, if you let fear creep in and don't don't handle it, it it's, it'll, it'll, it'll corrode you, like, fast. Mm. And uh, I didn't I didn't have my verses on my phone because I took my burner phone there. And I'm like, I didn't have a Bible because you don't bring a Bible to that part of the world. And, and so when I say so it in your heart and mind, I, I sat on the side of that river and I recited Psalm 23. I'll, I'll repeat it right now. Like, Please. the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through darkest valley, I will fear no evil because he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. And I, he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows. And surely his goodness and love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so, you know, when Jesus was in the wilderness and, and, uh, and the devil was tempting him, he didn't say, let me bust out my iPhone or my Bible. <laughs> like he had that in his heart. And, and I think like when you memorize a verse like that in those, in those moments, like, you, you really are equipped because equipped. when I say that and I like, meditate on his words, it really brings a peace in me. And that brought a tremendous peace in me. And uh, I literally, I could tell you, like, not cocky, like, I'm not bragging. Or I didn't have, at that moment, I sat in the rocks by myself and I recited that verse. And I, like, I felt like, let's do this. I felt like ready to go. Uh, besides getting that cold water because it was freezing. But <laughs> but as far as the Taliban, I, I just felt mm-hmm. ready to go, man. And, uh, and there's been times I've had, like, anxiety and depression and stuff like that. And I recite, like, a verse and I meditate on his words, like, you know, he refreshes my soul. And I'm like, man, it just brings me to a different place. And so, a long answer to your question of, uh, I don't know if that's a clip or not. It's beautiful, man. It's a YouTube <laughs> like, video. It's yeah. a YouTube video. Like, how do you, how do you, you know, get deeper spiritually? Yeah. A relationship with Jesus and knowing his word, man. And sow it, it in your heart. Well, I'll add one more thing based on your story that, that, that worked for you is you found, you got discipled. Like you got yeah. led by somebody else who could, who had already been there. This is true for, I mean, almost anything, business, relationships, yeah. spirituality, like be a mentor, right? Be a, yeah. Be a mentor or get mentored yeah. or both. Like that's, if, yeah, you become like those who you hang around with. So people yeah. are, I, I, I oftentimes will encounter people who are like, yeah, I, you know, I'm a Christian, uh, you know, I want to improve it, but I don't, I don't want to go to church. I don't believe in church. I, yeah. you know, it's not my, I don't like the organized religion. I'm like. It's, it's just like saying I want to be a really good real estate investor I'm not going to hang out any real estate investors yeah. I don't want to talk to any real estate investors ever I just prefer yeah. to just be you know, yeah. surrounded I'm like, or jiu-jitsu right I yeah, want to be really good yeah. jiu-jitsu but I don't want to yeah, train I don't with want to go trade. you got to train with somebody yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> it requires community dude that's a way better metaphor yeah it's <laughs> yeah. like I want to be jiu-jitsu I, I'm not, I'm not going to it go requires there. community yeah. like yep. we were created to have community like yeah. we're not created to do that life alone man and, uh, and when people get in hardships when, when you operate that way in business or, or then when you get in a crisis that's your go-to is try to do yeah. it by yourself and you're going to crash. I, I have a rule. Uh, I actually learned it in the Marine Corps, took it to MMA and then now I would have it in life. Uh, it was a recon thing. It was called plus minus equals. So you always train with somebody better than you. Cause they're going to, they're going to add the range. You want to shoot with somebody better than you. You, you want to shoot with somebody that's on a peer level. Cause it's going to push you. Like when you walk next to somebody, next thing you start faster and faster. Now you're running and then somebody not as good as you. So you're investing in them. Cause you learn a lot from being a teacher. And I took that in a mat. And every time I train just to this day, always train with somebody that I could beat up on because now I could really work on technique. I could dial in technique and I could give back to mm-hmm. my and build my team up so they're good too and I have a good environment to train in. I, I, I have a guy that's better than me that I, where I'm always feel like I need to get better and get pushed. Uh, and then uh, and then I have a guy that's like that guy that's neck to neck equal. Like we, we slap hands and I'm rubbing the palm of sweat because I know what we're about to like yeah. go. <laughs> I always have that, that, that plus minus equals. In a, in a, and then in my personal life, especially in my personal life as a Christian, like I always have someone that I'm going to let disciple me, that I'm going to let know the deeper, darkest things in my life that I'm going to have push me and, and grow me. I have someone that I'm mentoring and reinvesting into and discipling myself. 
than have someone that's not going to peer level with me that I'm going to go, you know, every day and have lunch with or a cup of coffee once a week with or something like that. And I think it's super important yeah. to have. That's beautiful, man. I love that answer. Now I don't have to make the video because you just did it way better than I could have. <laughs> All right, man. Well, uh, we got to shift towards the end here in a little bit. But first, I do have a question. You, you, your wife, Kathy? Yeah, Kathy. Correct? Yeah. What do you love about your wife? Man, uh, I think what I love most about her is that uh, she's like what they call, what they call the ride or die. Yeah. <laughs> like, like she's been just been through all this stuff. And if I if I go back from this podcast and say, man, Brandon and I had just a podcast, but it gave me epiphany, and I think I'm gonna start robbing banks tomorrow. Yeah. She's like, what do you want for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like she's I she's kind of like, and also she's uh one of the things, so you know she's been around like 17 to eight. So I was going through recon training. So she's been around it from the beginning. She's been around all special operations guys her whole life. But even through all that, she really doesn't know the difference of anything. She, I could be like a cook in, in the, in the air force and it just doesn't make a difference to her. Mm. She just doesn't care. It's just not important to her. So like, I think that's always been a really good thing. Like, because she's never carried a burden of that. Like when I'm out of Afghanistan, she's just like, Oh, he's at work. You know, like I like he's out by himself with disease and, and then, you know, in, in Peshawar of Pakistan yeah. <laughs> like she's not like biting her fingernails she's like oh he'll be back he's you know he's coming back in, in three months you know like not a big deal to her mm. so <laughs> alright and then I, I gotta ask this question as somebody who's raised a bunch of kids how many kids total do you have four four kids as <laughs> yeah, somebody and who's three ra- granddaughters now oh, wow. okay so somebody's a, what advice do you have for me as a not a new father I've been at this for seven years now but as a Father, pre, a preteen father. I'm not yet that phase. Yeah, love is spelled T-I-M-E. Mm. <laughs> That's the best. And you can't get it back. I'm in my second round right now. So so I have a, I have a 27-year-old, 26. I have a 26-year-old, a 25-year-old, 23-year-old. They're all married with kids. I got some grandkids. And I have an eight-month-old that Kathy and I just adopted, a family member. And so we, we are adopting her. She's our daughter. And, wow. uh, and so right now I'm experiencing... I was gone a lot of the times when my kids were growing up and you know, when I was there, I tried to make the best quality time I could. I, you know, hunting, fishing, shooting, hiking. I was a jujitsu coach. I was a wrestling coach since they were like three years old. Like, but there was still a lot of time and things I put before them. I mean, I put jujitsu before them a lot. I put, uh, I put, you know, uh, going out, going to Afghanistan. Sometimes I, it was a military school that I probably didn't have to go to, but I wanted to. And I, and I, and they, they came second. And I, it stings me to say that, but it's just true. And uh, my career always came first. And I justified it was like, because, you know, I, you could justify anything. Uh, but the truth is, that, that I look back and there was some things I could have done differently to spend more time with them. And I have a very close relationship with them now. Uh, but now, like, summer, this I've, I've, we've had her for, you know, going on five months now. Uh, I've, I'm making decisions now based on her being a more priority than I would have with my, with my other kids. And mm-hmm. it just feels different. And, and it's only based... Not that I love her anymore. I feel like I do. Like yeah. I feel like a special kind of love with her. Probably a lot of it has to be with my age and maturity. But it's not, it's not that I love her anymore than my other kids. I just have the wisdom of, of seeing both yeah. ends of it now. And, I, and, I, and I'm, and I'm going to take advantage of that. So if I could pass that wisdom to you know, younger parents out there, like, man, I, I heard that saying before. Love is spelled T-I-M-E. And that's how kids understand it. Yeah. You got to spend that time with them. Yeah. Beautiful, man. All right, let's move on toward the end. Next seg- segment is called the three, two, one pivot. Okay. So three pivot. Bo- so when I talk about a pivot, you know, I think of your life is going one direction and then something changes it. Maybe it pivots, you know, 1%, mm-hmm. maybe you alter 90% or 180 right, right. Um, degrees, but uh, three pivot books, two pivot people and one pivot quote. So we'll start with the books. What are three books that have uh, changed the direction of your life? Uh. A book called Wild at Heart oh, by John dude. Eldridge. <laughs> dude, I'm reading that right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I love yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, yeah. Wild at Heart. Yeah. Uh, my, my son's name is Wilder based on Wild yeah. at Heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love that book. Um, oh, man. I, um, it, the, I can't believe it slipped my mind right now because yeah, I read it earlier. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's one of my books I recommend to everyone. It's, uh, it's the business book. <laughs> I can't believe it slipped my mind right now. You can come back to it if you want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what's the what's the super the rich dad poor dad? No, it's That's a, a common one. Yeah, it's my slip. Of my <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> You'll remember it. Yeah, yeah. All right. But uh, um, there's a there's a two books that I think are really important, timely right now. One is called uh, uh Letters to the American Church. Okay. By uh, Eric Metaxas. Okay. And it's a very timely book right now. I just read it, and uh, and, uh, and it's it's really about it's it's, it's contrasting Bonhoeffer, 
mm. in the church uh, in the church of uh, of of Germany during uh, the rise of neo Nazism, and the church's silence and, and silence became complicity, mm. and uh, and it's very much a contrast to where we are in America right now. And I think it's a very timely book, and it's it's it, it basically took he took his he wrote a book called Bonhoeffer that's like this thick. And uh, and I read it, and it's it's really it's incredible. But most people aren't gonna read a book like you know yeah. five inches thick. So it's basically the the cleft notes of, of of Bonhoeffer into the book that that's pointed directly to the American church and where we're in America right now. And uh, I think it's one of the most powerful books that every American could read right now. Uh, and another book that that he wrote, not to plug same same author for two books, but uh, but um, since I can't remember the other one, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good to great. Oh yeah, yeah, good, good to, to great, good yeah, to great. yeah. That was, the, that was so now now get Collins, uh, so right? I, yeah, yeah, that was a great one. But um, but I will I will tell you his other one. Uh, uh, Atheism is dead. Atheism, uh, okay, I haven't read yeah, that. one. It's really good. You got to read it. Yeah, it's Atheism is dead. It doesn't, he doesn't do it as a, from an evangelical approach. He actually uses uh, science and and evolutionist positions to uh, really make a case for uh, there's no such thing as atheism. That atheism can't exist if people really try to try to validate what they believe. Fascinating man. It's really, it's really good, yeah. And he's Eric Metaxas is like an incredible author, and uh, and and I know you plug this book, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I got Saving disease. My favorite book that I wrote uh, is uh, an unfair advantage. Unfair advantage. Okay, yeah. I've not read that one yet. So yeah, it's it's just it, 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 pretty much like every chapter is like a sermon. I, I take a like a Afghanistan story or MMA story and and tie it to uh, tie it to a uh, biblical story and then. And a lesson from it. Love it. So All right, I'm gonna read well, I overdid it. Overdid your answer. No, dude, I love it. I love I love overdoing answers. Like, yeah. What's that quote that Stetson put on his resume? So Stetson, who helps wrangle all the guests for the podcast. Yeah. He wrote a quote on his resume when he applied. Like, he didn't even apply. He actually, uh, I remember the quote. But before he, well, what he, Stetson did is to get the job that he got here. Yeah. He didn't even know I was hiring. He got me free tickets to the rodeo in <laughs> Vegas because he worked for like an organization around that. So he got me and my wife front row tickets to the rodeo in Vegas. We get there. I go back to my hotel room afterwards. And I met him there. He brought me my drink that I like yeah. to to me that he had checked with my assistant. I go back to my uh, my hotel room and there's a bag on my bed. <laughs> and inside is my, a pair of jeans that were my size. Uh, and a bunch of other like re- like a, a, a whiskey flask and all this <laughs> stuff is like very much like stuff that I would yeah. like. And then his resume is sitting in there as well. And on top of the resume, it says, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. And that's the quote that uh, I like, will forever love Stetson for. That's an application or a bribery? Yeah, I know. A little of both. And <laughs> yeah, I, I, good, I texted him. I said, hey, let's meet tomorrow yeah, for coffee and uh, <laughs> offered him his job. And I was like, I think you're the guy. Yeah. Do you know that story? Did you yes, that's okay. amazing. Yeah, that, that is amazing. Yeah. 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 All right. So those are the books. Uh, two pivot people, people that have changed the direction of your life. Steve Toth. Uh, mm-hmm. Steve, Steve Toth. Uh, Really? That was the mentor, the disciple, yeah, mentor, dis- yeah. yeah the disciple is and, ship. Uh, and maybe this is fresh. All my kids have changed my life, mm. but uh, I don't think any more than this brand new baby girl summer. Yeah, uh, man, just something's happened in, in, in me the last you know months of having her um, that I didn't expect. I, I was naive enough to think like, hey, this is a family member, they're in need. God's really given us a you know, home and and, good, and the means and. We're in a good place in our life. We have the ability to do this. I've been an empty nester for five years. Kind of overrated. Uh, <laughs> you know, could use a little chaos and love in a home. So let, let, let's mm. let's do it. Let's. It was it was a no brainer. Like we were do it. So I was naive enough to think we we're blessing her. It totally the other way around. Like this has been like the biggest blessing. I wake up in the morning and she's like laying next to me. She didn't cry when she wakes up. She just like lays and stares at me, smiling and playing with my beard. And I, I'm like, I'm the luckiest person in the world. Like, and it's totally changed my like decisive process for like everything yeah. like everything everything in the last few months that I'm making decisions on like I had been needing to dial back my schedule and my bandwidth for like years like my chief of staff my I have a hundred people on staff at Mighty Oaks and they're all like like you can't do this forever you're gonna you're going to break and they're pushing me and I'm like yeah but it's too important I got to and uh and and all it took was to bring this little angel yep. into my life and I'm like yeah let's change my schedule like dial it back and yeah, no. it just changed. So I think I think she's like really just, and it just came at timely. So it's a it's been a gift for me. It's beautiful. Uh, man. Yeah, I, with and, and you know go back to Steve Toth. I would. Yeah, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Steve. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. All right, one pivot quote. What what quote has changed your life? Uh, Shale Richardson. Um, uh, courage is not the absence of fear, but the the decision that something's more important than that fear. And, and I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean that to say like, it's not, it's not a motivation for courage. Yeah. It's actually the opposite. It's like, it's like the people confuse, like when people do brave things for courage and it's saying that that's not actually courage. Like that's, 
like we have to recognize that some things are more important than mm. the fear. Or, um, you know, this, can I tell you a little, another little please, story? Man, I'm gonna, please, I'm going to overdo it again. I love it. We, we, were, we were just in Ukraine. Sea Spray is the guy that said lost like 37 pounds. At, yeah. He, he and I were in Ukraine. We were, we were like two hours past the, the Russian line in the red zone. We went to identify these mass grave sites. We, we identified 1,400 like little girls and women that had been executed. Jeez. And we we're coming back. That's happening in Ukraine? Yeah, yeah. That's Dude. It. Yeah, and by, by the book I have coming out with that catalog and all that stuff. Yeah, like, wow. It, it's, it was, it, we didn't, the reason we went and did that because the people that asked us could do it, people in our, in our government that, Ukraine was reporting it and they were like, of course they're going to report stuff like that. They get more money, right? Yeah. So they wanted us to actually go and we didn't. We, and so I leaked it to Fox News. I called Doc Fox News. I'm on a reporter and the reporter's giving me a hard time. Like a lot of people give me a hard time. Like, why are you in Ukraine? I think you and I were talking about yeah. this earlier. Like, Zawinski's corrupt. We're sending hundreds of billion dollars, which by the way, I don't think we should be sending I think it's a money laundering machine. Mm. And uh, and I'm like, yeah, Zawinski is corrupt, but so is so is Biden and so is uh, everybody, <laughs> so every other politician since yeah. the beginning of time. Like, who's surprised that politicians are corrupt, right? <laughs> I'm not there for Zawinski or Biden. I'm there to help these people, people right? Yeah. And uh, and if you ever, you know, kind of side note, if you ever get let your politics get in the way of your compassion for people, you should probably change your politics. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, uh, we have to be able to help people if you're in a position to. But we were getting, uh, so the reporter was giving me a kind of hard time. She's like, why are you guys even there? And I'm like, it's the right thing to do. I just said a simple answer. I was tired, aggravated. It's the right thing to do. And then, uh, and then she asked Sea Spray, "Is it worth it?" And Sea Spray said, it, without even hesitating, he said, it "Doesn't have to be." And uh, you know, I think right now, especially as Americans, we think like with everything under the ROI, like our return on investment. Like I'll give my time, my energy, my resources. Uh, but is it worth it? Is it dangerous? What's the risk? We assess everything. And, and you know, as Sea Spray said, like it doesn't always have to be worth it to do the right thing. Yeah. And sometimes things are scary and, and, you, and uh, hmm. you know, but is, is, uh, is what we're called to do and burden to do more important than that fear, that risk, that ROI. And I think the world needs, the whole world, we all need to be like ask ourselves that question right now. Yeah. So. Thousand percent, man. All right. This segment is called Past, Present, Future. What advice do you have for your younger self? We'll start with that one. I, I think if I went back to my younger self, I actually thought about this before. Like, like I would tell myself, you know, it's it's not about me. Mm. Um, I think when we're younger, it's all yeah. it's all about us. Like we we think the whole world revolves around us. Like the whole universe revolves around us, and uh, and so we get self focused on achievements, and it's unfulfilling. I, sp I see it a lot with the special operations community. Like there's this there's this strive to achieve, and nothing's ever good enough. Like I, I want to go to this next school and get this next title and get this next accolade make this next and then you transition to business world and I want to make this next amount of money and I want to get you know get to this status and it never it's a never ending like desire that you're never going to fulfill one I was getting interviewed one time this guy read my whole bio and I didn't even read my whole bio it's kind of early on in Mighty Oaks I literally felt like I wanted to crawl on a table because I was embarrassed and the guy's like <laughs> man this amazing bio how does it make you feel I'm like actually it makes me feel embarrassed I feel like it, you just described the most incontent person that ever. <laughs> like, and as it was like I've just never designed contentment and, uh, and so you're pursuing all this stuff because you think it's about you, mm -hmm. but there was a transition in my life to where I stopped living for myself and started living for others. And actually, that's when I found that fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So like the living like for others and realize it's not about you, every decision I make uh, has to be like for others. Like I actually found the fulfillment that I was always seeking before. I have a process right now. Like I get offered a lot of opportunities like uh, right now because of you know, Mighty Oaks is successful and I've, I've built you know, a pretty decent platform. And so people were asking me things. I'm always my decision making process is uh, does Mighty Oaks benefit? Because that's my primary, I feel my primary burden, my heart, my responsibility. And, and is this uh, is this decision going to benefit others, or does or, or does it benefit me solely? If it benefits me and doesn't fit those other two, then I say no. Mm. Even though it's as lucrative as it may be for me, yeah. and I've had some real lucrative opportunities I've said no to, and I'm not saying that braggadociously. It's just that's my criteria. Because I know I won't find satisfaction. It'll lead me down a place to yep. being dissatisfied if I pursue that other path. Dude, I love I yep. love that framework. I yep. really, really like that. Uh, I'm going to encourage everyone to hit that little rewind button 30 seconds <laughs> or a minute and just listen to that again. It's so good. All right, next one. What is something that I think I, 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 I know one of the answers you'd give for this one because you have a new little uh, child in your life. But what is something that you've done in the past year that has given you a better life? Uh, I, I think... It, getting getting a hold of a like my my schedule but it goes deeper than that it's relinquishing control and trust uh to people so i i was 
I didn't realize I was doing this. I thought I let it go a long time ago, but uh, I think I'm a fearful person. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I've been speaking a lot on fear. I've, I've been doing this message called fear not. And, and the reason I felt compelled to do this message is because that fear, uh, in me led to me being very controlling. And mm-hmm. I always want to control things that I probably shouldn't be controlling or probably have no control of the outcome. And so when I feel like I lose control of things, I get really like, I get really like fearful. It's um, the results not going to be what I want. And so I over control things. So, uh, and especially as a parent, like, uh, I want to control the safety of my kids. I feel responsible for them and I want to. And so as I became adults, like, man, if you make this decision, look at the consequences. And I'm like trying to over control them. And, uh, and so relinquishing that fear, uh, and trading it for faith. And that really took me to a deeper spot to my relationship with God and really made me dig deeper into God's word, understanding God's word and, and coming to a point to where I realized like, I love my kids, but I can never love my kids more than God loves my kids. Mm. I can protect my kids and I feel like I'm capable of protecting my kids, mm. but I can never protect my kids more than God can. And, uh, and you know, in the safest place my kids could be is in God's will. So if they're pursuing God's will and it looks dangerous and looks scary to me, then I know that the safest place it could be is that. I mean, for me going to, that goes for me, like me going to Afghanistan. Probably, you know, most people would think, man, the safest place I could be is sitting back on my couch watching on Fox News, like angry about what the White House is doing. No, the safest place for me to be is is in Afghanistan, and that's where God's will is for me. Yeah. Right? That's I get, that's the safest place that I could be, and uh, you know, and that's really taking that perspective from worldly to eternal, and really having a, a faith and trust. So I've really worked on that in the last year. And I, like, it has something I thought I had, but I realized, and where I realized that, that was, was the Ukraine. Cause when my son, my son was one of my son, Hunter, who's an Afghanistan veteran was one of those 12 that came on that, that team to Afghanistan. And, and when I was going, he's like, Hey, I'm going with you. And I'm like, no, you're not like, <laughs> we're probably going to go to Afghanistan. You're not going with me. He's like, I'm a, I'm not your, I'm your son, but I'm a, Af- I'm a Marine. I'm an Afghanistan veteran too. And I had an interpreter there and I feel like you can't take this from me yeah. pretty much. And I'm like, man, I can't take this from him, but I could bench him. Yeah. So, so he, he stayed in Abu Dhabi, like the, you know, and didn't go to Afghanistan. He wanted to come to the Tajikistan river. And, and I'm like, I can't be thinking about that. Like yeah. Dennis is coming with me. I can't be thinking about you, which is probably the right choice at the time. Yeah. And, and then he, then he wanted to come to Ukraine. And so we put him in Ukraine and he worked in Poland and, and I ran our, talk because uh he's very smart comms he's an anglico marine so he's like super smart comms and equipment he's like super org- organized logistics guy and he was crushing it and we went across the border that night we were in that house when benjamin hall got hit and pierre got killed and and they and we got asked to go across the border and rescue benjamin hall and recover the body of pierre and nine of us were in that house and everybody was like you know some receipts spray saying like there's an american over there he's got a wife and two daughters and if we don't go get him the u.s government can't the military can't the agency can't He's going to die. Like yeah. we're this we're his only option there. And all nine of those people in that room last night raised their hand and was ready to go, including Hunter. And then Hunter stayed back, stayed back. Not my choice. Actually, Sea Spray kept him in the talk. Him and a guy named Sean and then another guy from the government agency stayed in the talk. And and he was he was bummed. But fast forward, uh, now just last month, he's uh he he led the trip with several special op- tier one wow. special operations guys led the trip to Ukraine and uh, to train thirty five chaplains. And he's been past the front lines and he's leading. So the transition of this last year was me relinquishing my fear as a father and this young man, not just my son, who was very equipped and trained and God's burdened his heart to do these missions and, and help these people and, uh, and me holding him back from what God's calling him to do because of my own fear. So I was forced to relinquish that, to have faith in my son and faith in God to, to protect him in a way that I can't. That's what that's actually what the Ukraine book's about. It's not about Ukraine. Yeah, the Ukraine's the backdrop. It's about that that process between me and my son. I'm excited to read that one. Yeah, I'm very excited. <laughs> All right, what do you want? I mean, the question is, what do you want your legacy to be? But I want to define it more specifically, and that is, someday when you pass away mm-hmm. and people talk about you, mm-hmm. what do you want that that line to be? Oh yeah, he was blank. Yeah, um, I forget his name. The guy who founded a uh, Salvation Army. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, well, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, uh, for his name too. Yeah. But it, it, in his tombstone, it said one thing: uh, others. Mm. And I, I think that's for me. Like, there's a lot of, a lot of titles that I've got given, got given amongst the years of my life. But the, probably the most, uh, the one that I'm most proud of is, is dad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if I was remembered for one word, it'd be like someone that you know always went out of the way to serve serve others. Because everything I've done has been a servant. Uh, but there were there were phases of my life that it, servanthood was about self fulfillment, yeah. and so I, w- I just want to be known for, for you know someone that gave up for others and and someone that led people to to do the same for others right because uh, 
there's a, there's a, something we say at Mighty Oaks Foundation. If the people who follow you today, and there's always people following you, if they ended up where you are today, would they be living a life that you'd be proud of? Mm. You know, if they, if they followed you, like behind closed doors, they yeah. followed you, the life you're living, would they be in the place you'd be proud of? And uh, so I hope the life that I'm living right now will lead people that's following me to a place that, you know, I'd be proud to see them follow, including my kids. And, and that, that place that I, that I go is, you know, pursuing the servant, serving of others. Beautiful. Beautiful, man. All right, two more questions. First one, what are you excited about? What's coming up? Uh, man, I, I'm really excited about, uh, some, you know, there's lots of things I'm excited about. What I'm most excited about right now is next month we launch our first SIV program mm. at Mighty Oaks. So we, uh, we have a program coming at Mighty Oaks to where we, uh, these SIVs that did make it here, the, the interpreters that fall alongside of us 20 years, like I did eight deployments in Afghanistan. Some of these guys didn't do deployments. They did like 15 years straight of fighting. Yeah. And, and, and then they, they leave with a backpack, left everything behind. They're, they're every, oh, they're, and, and many of their family members, people were killed in their family. Some of them's wife and kids are still in Afghanistan. They, they can't go to the VA. They don't have a government program. There's no re- assimilation program for them. They don't have any. The government didn't set up anything to care for them and help them assimilate. You think they don't? They don't have PTSD or mm. dealing with things. There's nothing for them. So we recognize this need and said, "Hey, uh, these people may be Muslims, and we're a Christian organization, but we're going to show them the love of God, and we're going to we're going to stand up a program for them, and, and we'll be open about who we are. Uh, we're not going to make it like a proselytizing evangelical program, but we're going to teach them the biblical principles that we use to move forward our troops forward with, and they know what they're coming into." And, uh, and so Aziz has been going out, uh, cause Aziz is a Christian, uh, now, and he's, uh, he's been going out speaking around the country to them and letting them know about the program. And so next month we have our first SIV program in California at Sky Rose Ranch. And we have 24 of them that are scheduled to come to wow. this program. And it'd be the first one of its kind. No one else is, is doing, I, I don't say that competitively cause I hope other people do it too. I hope yeah. we challenge other people to do it. But, uh, I mean, when these people, when these guys come here, it's, it's really telling that uh, it's been really telling to see that the mosque have not welcomed them and helped them. It's mm. really weird. Like you'd think the mosque would be like open their arms to them, but it's been the Christian church and not in an evangelical way. Like it's been women from the church showing up, welcome to our community. Here's some cookies. Can I buy you some groceries? Let me take you out, buy some clothes for the kids. You need a job. Like let's help you get a job. Uh, you need a house. Like it's been the Christian church helping. And you see these mosques coming in and saying, hey, they're just trying to convert you. Like, don't go to them. And, and they're like, where's, do you have any cookies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to help me get a job? And, uh, and so there's been a lot of churches around the country that are like, come reaching out to us and be like, what can we do to help them? Yeah. They're struggling. Like, uh, you know, they, they don't, so they've been reaching out to us and it really gave us this network and ability. And we have the ability to help kind of goes back to the thing, right? If you have the ability to help and you're equipped to, and that needs there and you feel a burden to do it, then do it. And, and God's really done that for us. So we're going to set up our next, I'm super proud of Aziz and our team because they've been training for about about seven or eight months now to prepare this program. This will be the first one. And I'm, I'm super excited yeah, about that's it, that's very cool. Yeah. I love it, man. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, where would you like people to most to, to follow you, connect with you, learn more about you? Where's the best place to send people? I get the best center point for me is Instagram. Okay. Even though, like I said, even though I get censored there, it's still the <laughs> center point. It's kind of the belly button of everything I do. And what's your handle there? It's- uh, I think it's Chad Robo official. But if you just type my name in, Chad Robo Show, it comes up. It's uh, super easy to spell too. Yeah, super easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chad Robo underscore official. Yeah, but, uh, I'm sure you, you guys probably have the spelling in the show notes or something. Yes, we do. Yeah, we definitely yeah. will. And of course, yeah. I follow you, and we'll blast you all over my social media when this episode comes yeah. out. So <laughs> it's there, and uh, and then uh, you know I have a website, chadroboshow.com, and then Mighty Oaks Foundation is uh, you know first of all I'll say like obviously we need support. Yeah. We do eight million dollars a year in program, and we do it because of uh, amazing people from around the world especially this nation get behind, you know, take care of our warriors. So we appreciate your support. But more importantly than that, if there's any military, uh, that includes veterans, first responders, spouses, all of our programs are free. And so anybody needs help, uh, reach out to us, you can apply, the apply button's easy and we'll be back in touch. We'll, we'll, you know, if you're struggling, you don't have to do it by yourself. You were never meant to do it by yeah. yourself and we're here to help. So can I ask you to do one quick favor for me? I think this will be a good clip for, you know, for the, it, it might help people. That camera right there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Would you look at that and talk to people, m- military veterans, who are struggling uh, with the fear uh, and anxiety, yeah, uh, and difficulty, and maybe even the temptation of taking their own life. Yeah, I mean, man, it, you, when you when you're in that moment, and especially if you're there now, like, uh, you may feel like you're the only one that's ever dealt with this or dealing with this, and and the truth is, 
uh, what's in your heart is in the heart of probably every person you know, like a feeling of hopelessness, a feeling of despair. At some point in people's lives, we all struggle with this. And, and we think like no one could ever feel like this. No one could feel so hopeless. They don't want to live anymore. No one's marriage could be so bad that they don't, they feel like this only solution is divorce. And, and, and the truth is, you know, you're not alone. Like I said earlier, you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to figure it out by yourself. There's people that love you and care about you, what, even people you don't know. And uh, the, I always say like, kind of back to what Steve said to me, you know, if what you're doing isn't working, why not try something different? What do you have to lose besides reaching out to a free program that has the most amazing food enough to where you probably could put 15 pounds on in a week, uh, uh, most amazing food, incredible facility, all paid for by a country that loves you and thanks you for your service. It doesn't, by, by the way, it doesn't matter like if you got dishonorably discharged. I know a lot of nonprofits are like, hey, you got to have the honor. We don't care about any of that. If you raised your hand and was willing to serve, we will take care of you, and it will fly you out to the ranch. Uh, you'll you'll be able to con connect with a, a group of people uh, that can lock arms with you and help you move forward and figure it out. Uh, that way, you don't have to figure it out by yourself. And where do they go to learn about that? Uh, MightyOaksPrograms.org, and at the top of the webpage is a apply button. Just click that apply button. You'll get immediate email back, and then someone will contact you. Uh, if you don't call, if you don't follow the email instructions and contact us, then we'll hunt you down and contact you. I love it, man. So, yeah. Hey. Chad, that's been amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, man. Thank you, bro.